Hello, son. This week ended fast, and I hope that you managed to survive these tough days. Tonight, it's a relaxation night. Grab a drink and lay down. Let me entertain you with some truly scary stories for a few hours. Let's go, son. I grew up in southern Georgia in the woods and swamps, hunting and hanging daily. Fast forward 20 years. I'm on my lease hunting property near Whitmire, South Carolina. I found it strange that the old guys in the club would never ever hunt alone in these woods. I normally carry a .36 while in the woods. One evening it was getting late, 20 minutes or so, maybe before dark. I'm watching some small ponds sitting over a road in the tall pines. I'm in my climber maybe 10 feet or so up in the tree. I love the woods, but hate heights. The woods are loud, but then very quiet. Okay, I thought. I was just hoping for a big buck. The next thing I hear is someone walking towards me in the small pines. But then they just stop. It's getting really dark. I start hearing deep groans where the walking had stopped. I'm thinking that it was a bear or a cat, which would be very uncommon in this area. A big cat, maybe. But bears this far south is not normal. It gets very quiet again. I could see the small road well in the moonlight. The next thing I hear, the groans are immediately under me, almost beside me. Now the groans are becoming growls. Also, the odor was a bit overwhelming, just like a dead animal in the woods. I thought that a stinky animal was climbing on my tree and felt like I was going to be grabbed. I started moving a bit, trying to get my gun pointed down and lifting my feet. I was shaking because I was freaking scared. I could hear heavy breaths. I started yelling down. If you're a club member trespassing, I don't care. Just identify yourself, or I'm gonna freaking start shooting. I thought someone was trying to get at me in the tree stand. I never heard another sound, and the foul odor was gone. I put my gun on my back and started slowly climbing down the tree. No more than two or three steps down the tree. I smelled that awful odor again. Then I heard a low groan. It was right in front of my face. But it was so dark that I saw nothing. It scared me so bad I stood up and jumped into the dark in the other direction. When I hit the ground I rolled around, jumped to my feet and ran down to the road. I ran as hard as I could to the gravel road where I could see well in the moonlight. At this time I remembered that my buddy was down at the bottom of the road in the small pines where I put him in a big box stand. I didn't see his light, so I had to run down that road to get to the bottom by the rivers. He was down by the rivers. When I ran up to him, he said, Man, there's some weird shit going down. We need to go. We slowly walked together back up toward the gravel road. I heard someone walking on both sides of us all the way. I think my buddy was hearing it too. We didn't speak during the entire walk, maybe five to six hundred yards for some reason. I didn't feel my gun was going to help. I had hollered earlier, threatening to shoot, and whoever this was, they weren't scared. When we got to the gravel road, the entire atmosphere had changed. It was almost eleven o'clock at night by then. My buddy didn't talk much. We went back to camp and had some food. We went to bed. I could hear him rolling around all night, and I didn't sleep a wink. I've been a park ranger for over a decade, and in that time I've seen some incredible things. But nothing could have prepared me for the truth about what was really happening in the national park where I work. It all started when I noticed that there had been an unusually high number of disappearances in the park. Hikers, campers, and even other park rangers had vanished without a trace, and despite our best efforts, we couldn't find any clues as to what had happened to them. That's when I started to notice something strange. My supervisor and some of my colleagues seemed to be hiding something from me. They would speak in hushed tones when I was around, and I could sense that they were holding back information from me. Finally, I confronted my supervisor, demanding to know what was really going on in the park. That's when he revealed the truth. There were unknown predators in the park, creatures that were preying on hikers and campers and even other park rangers. 
I was shocked and horrified by this revelation, but what really terrified me was the fact that my colleagues had been keeping this information from me. How long had they known about these creatures? And why hadn't they done more to warn people or protect them from harm? I knew that I couldn't keep this information to myself. I went to the media and shared the truth about what was really happening in the park. But instead of being praised for my bravery, I was fired from my job as a park ranger. Now I'm on the run, pursued by the very people I used to work alongside. But I won't stop until the truth about the unknown predators in the park is exposed. I know that it's dangerous and that these creatures could come after me at any moment. But I won't rest until justice is served and the innocent people who have vanished in the park are given the answers they deserve. And I am John, a seasoned park ranger. I know these woods like the back of my hand, or so I thought. One day I received a call that changed everything. A murder had occurred in the park, and no one knew who did it. When I arrived at the scene, it was clear that no human could have committed such a heinous act. The victim's body was mangled, and deep claw marks were etched into the ground. As I began to investigate, a feeling of dread came over me. I knew that something terrible was lurking in these woods, something not of this world. And then I saw it, a creature unlike any I had ever seen before. It stood over eight feet tall with razor-sharp claws and eyes that glowed like fiery embers. Its breath was hot and putrid, and its movements were quick and precise. I knew I had to catch this beast before it killed again. But as I pursued it deeper into the woods, I realized that I might not make it out alive. The predator was nowhere to be found, and I was getting frustrated. I knew that if I didn't solve this case soon, more lives would be in danger. I went back to the scene of the crime and found a small scrap of fur that looked like it belonged to the predator. I sent it to the lab for analysis and waited anxiously for the results. When they finally came in, my worst fears were confirmed. The predator was a genetically modified creature that had escaped from a nearby laboratory. I immediately contacted the lab and informed them of the situation, and they sent a team to recapture the creature. But the creature was too strong and too smart for them. It outsmarted the scientists and managed to escape yet again. I knew that it was only a matter of time before it struck again. I spent every waking moment searching for the predator tracking it down through the thick underbrush and deep into the heart of the park. As I closed in on it, I knew that this would be the moment of truth. Would I be able to stop it before it killed again? With my heart pounding in my chest, I came face to face with the creature. It was enormous with razor-sharp claws and teeth like knives, but I was determined not to back down. I drew my weapon and prepared to fight for my life. The creature lunged at me, and we engaged in a vicious battle. It was like nothing I had ever experienced before, but I was determined to come out on top. In the end, I managed to take down the predator and save countless lives. As I stood there gasping for breath and covered in blood, I knew that I had made the right decision to become a park ranger. I had protected the park and the people who visited it, and I had proved that even in the face of great danger, a single person can make a difference. I was walking home from fishing, taking a different trail, as I got about two third roads. Up the hill I had the hair on my neck stand up and a feeling like I was being watched. This was around 5 p.m. I just casually kept walking till I got home, always checking my back. It happened again within a week, maybe a few days. Did not smell anything, cause I had been fishing or no smell anyway wasn't long afterwards I was checking on the clouds of a thunderstorm when lightning struck close to the trailer. By this, I mean I had my head out the door. I heard a yell about 70 yards behind the trailer. It didn't sound like a cow, but I checked anyway. No cows had been in the area for at least six months. The scream was high-pitched without coming down a lot at the end. With my wife being there, I just closed the door and didn't say nothing. I would say the following Sunday afternoon, my wife went to church at 6 p.m., and I stayed home to watch TV. 
about 45 men. Later, I was laying on the couch watching TV when something had blacked out my window at the far end of my trailer. The window was one feet wide and three feet tall. I'd raised up to look out my picture window above the couch and it turned the corner and walked around the steps at the back door. It was looking off into the woods and as it kept walking it looked at the ground. Understand this though, I had clear plastic on my window to keep heat in from winter. He hadn't taken it down yet. When it got to the window, I'd already laid back down on the couch, looking up and lay still. It looked down at me and kept walking, hopefully. I laid there for about as long as I could stand, maybe a minute. Then I got off the couch by sliding on the floor. Went and got my gun, walked back in the living room and waited a minute, then went outside making all noise I could. I checked the back of the trailer, nothing there. Details of Bigfoot is as follows. He was about seven feet tall, maybe seven feet. Three, solid black, no white or brown that I could see. Remember the plastic. His head was more rounded and not cone-shaped. I could not see the color of his eyes or anything like that. He was broad-shouldered and thinner around the waist than what you usually see in the pictures, and he walked more upright, not humped over like a gorilla. His hands hung around his thighs. The next morning, around 10 a.m., I got up from bed as I worked second shift then. My wife told me a friend of mine had come down to see me. I asked what did he want. She said she only saw him as the top of his head went across the kitchen window. We had to set the trailer on four blocks high and three on the other end, which meant you could not see anyone walking in front of the trailer, not out the kitchen window anyway. I told her my friend was six feet four and with a hat on. You could not see him the way she had told me. We lived on rocky ground, but I had one dusty dirt spot at the end of the trailer, hoping he had walked in it. I checked, and in the middle was a footprint. It was about twelve and a half inches long, and three and a half to four inches wide at the heel. Being dust, it was only one-fourth deep. There were only three toes, which I did not understand at the time. I told some friends at work, and one came to see it. The following Friday or Saturday night, he and a friend of his came over, no drinking sorry, and I told him the whole story. My friend was not hard convinced but his friends started talking big. So I told them, let's go outside, joking around to see how brave he was when we heard two dogs about medium to small size started barking and chasing something on the other ridge behind my trailer, which was not far at all, maybe 200 yards. They chased it into the small valley about 50 yards, south of us. When one dog quit barking, the other gave one more. Then it was quiet stunned. We looked at each other and Bigfoot started running back towards us. It stopped about 80 yards from us and started to hit a tree with something that sounded like a branch about four to five inches thick. Then it ran closer to about 40 yards and done the same thing again. By this time all bravery was gone. I went back in the trailer and got my gun. Come back out and ask if anything had happened. The brave guy thought he might have seen something in the shadows south of us light was on, of course. They took the gun away from me, and I didn't mind, thinking I had a way of escape, but we heard nothing else. My nearest neighbor is about 250 yards away, mother-in-law, no one else for at least a mile. No reason to mess with us that I could even think of. That was the last I've seen or heard of him. I have been a park ranger for over a decade, and I have spent countless hours in the woods, but nothing could have prepared me for what I encountered on that fateful day. I was out on a routine patrol when my radio suddenly went dead. I tried to retrace my steps back to camp, but the dense forest made it impossible to find my way back. As the sun began to set, I realized I was lost. Panic set in as I realized I had no food or water, and the temperature was quickly dropping. As I stumbled through the underbrush, I heard something rustling in the bushes ahead. I froze, waiting for whatever was making the noise to reveal itself. After a few tense moments, a massive creature emerged from the foliage. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen before, towering over me on two legs, with fur as black as midnight and eyes that glowed in the darkness. The creature let out a low growl, and I knew I was in serious danger. 
I tried to back away, but it was too fast. It lunged at me, its razor-sharp claws slashing through the air. I managed to dodge the first attack, but the creature was relentless. It chased me through the forest, its deafening roar echoing through the trees. I was sure I was going to die, but then, as I stumbled through the underbrush, I saw a glimmer of hope. In the distance, I spotted a faint light. I knew it was a ranger station, and I knew that was my only chance. With all the strength I could muster, I ran towards the light. The creature was hot on my heels, but I could hear it slowing down as I got closer to the station. Finally, I burst through the door, slamming it shut behind me. I was battered and bruised, but I was alive. The creature had disappeared back into the woods, and I was left alone to process what had just happened. In the days that followed, I couldn't stop thinking about the creature that had attacked me. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen before, and I knew that no one would believe me if I told them what had happened. But I also knew that I had survived and that I had a duty to warn others about the dangers that lurked in the deep woods. I never forgot the terror I felt that night, but I also never forgot the resilience and strength that helped me survive. But I grew up seeing shadow people, white shadow people too. When Slender Man got popular, I immediately thought of some of the things I've seen here. There was some sort of entity that would harass the little girls who lived here. Nothing horribly obscene or anything but my sister used to complain about a figure that would walk around her bed at night and say mean stuff to her. Like it would walk back and forth and call her string bean an ugly little ginger bitch. By the way, after my sister was telling me this all upset and shit, I actually laid off of teasing her for being a ginger for a couple years. It made me feel really bad. Anyway, she said she could never see its face or anything, but its outline was like the Grinch from the old Christmas movie. She'd always complain about it, and my older cousin, also female, chimed in while she was talking to me about it and said she had the same thing happen to her when she would stay here. They both agreed that it lived in a hole in the air between two oak trees that just refused to grow, an area my sister refused to play. Those oak trees have been the same size since I was probably five years old and I'm 33 now, still the same size. Keep those trees in mind. It gets weird about the trees. So shortly after my friend moved out, about a year later, my girlfriend and her daughter moved in. After about six months, her daughter started complaining about the same thing. She was scared to tell us at first. She would come in and wake us up, and we figured it was just her being scared of the dark. She was around six at this time. One morning, while we were getting her ready for school, she started quietly telling her mom about it. Could tell she was embarrassed and didn't want to talk about it. I was making coffee, and it stopped me dead in my tracks. I stopped and squatted down to talk to her and smiled to try to ease her worry and got her talking more about it. She straight up called it the Grinch like that was its name. She said it just walked around her bed saying mean stuff to her. Never touch her or, or anything. I asked what kind of mean stuff and she said he walks back and forth and he says bad words and calls me fat piggy and dumb little girl. In other words, I'm not supposed to say. Freak me out super bad started texting my sister about it, and would have contacted my cousin too, but she is estranged from most of the family at this point. So my sister and I talk about it, put up crosses in the house, I put up some Norse protection runes, salt at the doors, and sage the house. It apparently subsided after that, so one or all of those worked. When I was walking her to the bus stop for school a couple months later, she pointed at the area between the two oak trees that won't grow and said, That's where that stupid Grinch lives. Ha! Can't get me any more stupid Grinch! And then she threw a rick at the trees. It was pretty funny, but I got concerned again and started asking her about it. She said she was fine and she hadn't seen him in a long time. I'm assuming since I took some precautions and used warding of various types. So I asked what she meant by him living between the trees. She told me he lives in the air between them, like when we watch Stargate. 
So trying to get more answers before the bus comes, I ask her how she knew that and if she could see him right now. She looked back at the trees and said, No, he's not here right now. He only comes out at night because the sun makes him invisible. So now I ask if I could see him if I tried. She says no, only girls can see him and you're a boy so you're not supposed to see him. And then the bus came and we kinda dropped it after that. But ever since then I've got weird unexplainable knocking on windows, particularly when I'm in the shower. My girlfriend at the time, the girl's mom, and I split up several years ago and I still get the window knocking and weird noises. I'm used to it now because that's just life here. It's always been weird as hell. Saw Greenman's face once when I was a kid. Weird piece of property we've got here. Lowell edit. So for further reference, my girlfriend's daughter never met my cousin and never talked to my sister about stuff like that. So it's not like the idea was planted in her head by them or anything. Later on, when talking to my sister about it, she told me that maybe it's because she's getting older, but as time goes on, she has forgotten more and more about it. She said she doesn't even remember it having the outline of the Grinch anymore. She remembers calling it that and knowing that it looked like the Grinch before, but doesn't remember the outline. She used to be able to go into detail about it, but now all she vividly remembers is the ginger bitch part. And maybe that's due to growing up, adulting, and prioritizing memories, but she's 35 and I'm 33. I remember these conversations vividly because it freaked me out so bad. I am 20 and me and my buddies enjoy late night walks on the trails within the various conservation areas in my region of southwestern Ontario. Late last week week we decided to check out an area called Pleasant Valley. To my knowledge this area has a deep rooted history with the Underground Railroad, indigenous peoples, as well as the War of 1812 if I am not mistaken given its proximity to Lake Erie. We entered the woods at about 2 a.m. and immediately upon entering, I was overcome with a bad feeling, and after walking for some time, the feeling progressively worsened, until we reached two bent trees and an X over the path. My one buddy pointed out the fact that it's bad juju to go underneath and we should just call it a night, as we all felt watched. As soon as we turn around and start to head back, the entire forest seemed dramatically quieter. We all hear a loud, distinctively human whistle behind us, almost like how you would call a dog over. There is no way anyone could have been out there at that hour, and there is no homes in close enough proximity for someone to be out and about. We all ran, and I was honestly terrified, me, and my friends are all relatively big guys, and we are all comfortable in the woods, so it takes a lot to get us running low. Any ideas? Hello, what a people thing this thing was. A demon goblin something else. Why was it in my house? This took place in a suburb of Minneapolis, Minnesota around 2015. My father was a police officer for 30 years. He is a respected member of the city council and an all-around reliable dude. He told me that a few years back he walked into the bathroom late at night to get ready for bed and a four-foot-tall demon thing was standing on the bathroom rug facing him. He didn't feel scared, but sensed that the creature was just being annoying. It had long arms hanging almost to the floor and had brown fur, but wasn't super hairy. He said it had a bat-like face, but not quite as smooshed. His first reaction was to say, in the name of Jesus, leave my house. He said it just kind of stared at him, then jumped up and vanished through the closed bathroom window. No broken glass. End of story. This happened in the summer of 2020 in Lawrence County along Blaine Creek in eastern Kentucky. My mom's home, where I grew up, is situated in the middle of the Appalachian Mountains. There are no houses or neighbors within half a mile of her house. The area is simply beautiful mountains. One night her old dog was barking, whimpering, and growling. He just wouldn't stop acting up. 
My mom was confused since there were no outside noises that she herself could hear. The dog was pacing back and forth to the door and windows. After 30 minutes or so, she decided to grab her flashlight and go outside to make sure everything was okay. No animals had been messing with her trash cans, so she figured her dog was picking up the smell of a raccoon or other nocturnal critter. She scanned her yard and the creek and didn't see anything out of place. So she turned to go back into the house, and that's when she saw it. I will give the best description that I can from what she told me. I've never seen it myself and hope I never do. She said it was standing on its hind legs. These hind legs looked like an animal's, but the front looked more human. It had patches of long, light-colored fur all over the body and legs. The top looked like a humanoid man, while the lower part looked like an animal. The face was very odd. She called it an alien apeman. She said that it stood about seven feet in height and was muscular. She stood paralyzed with fear, shining her light on it. It looked at her. Then it started walking on all fours out of her yard, towards the back and toward the mountain. It did stop and look back at her a few times, but finally disappeared into the darkness. There was another encounter. One night, a few weeks later, her dog began acting up again. She decides to stay inside. She turned her lights off and looked out of her dining room window. There was a pole light in the yard. She was able to see it again, although it was further away from her and not as detailed. She said it had the same shape and was the same thing she saw just weeks earlier. She backed away from the window for a few minutes, then looked out again. It was gone. After that, she would walk out onto the back porch and fire her shotgun at dusk, hoping the creature would heed her warning. It's been over two years now, and she still fires the shotgun every early evening. The creature hasn't returned. I had just gotten up from sleeping and was putting on clothes for the a.m., fishing with my friend. I was standing and looking out the upper bedroom window and saw a large, grayish-brown, hairy figure trotting through the edge of the woods towards the log cabin and turned to trot across the earth dam. I immediately went downstairs and asked my friend if he was attempting to play a joke, but he was already down at the boat in another direction. The figure had been jogging or trotting at a moderate pace with a hunched-over stance, and I witnessed it for six to ten seconds before it disappeared across the lake. I am a Marine Corps veteran from Vietnam, and I have better than 20-20 vision I have been on many fishing trips in the area for about ten years. When the figure was moving through the tree area, it looked as though it was brushing some of the limbs with its body. I was driving back home from my friend's place in rural western Minnesota around 1-2 a.m. I was driving through this area that's about three-fourths of a mile long that's just a long canopy of dense trees. Dark even in the day, but at night it's pitch black. You can barely see 20 feet in front of you, even with high beams on. Anyway, driving about six feet away from the side of the road 100 feet ahead of me, I see something that looks wrong in a way I can't explain. You know when something doesn't make sense to you, or you know something isn't right. Like the parasympathetic feeling we get when we see someone break their ankle. We know it isn't supposed to bend that way, so it gives us the heebie-jeebies. It was like that, but I wasn't sure why until I was 30 feet away from it. It was this coyote standing on its hind legs and was way too tall to be an actual coyote standing upright. Coyotes are the size of a very small lab, like 50 pounds, on a good day, if that. This thing was at least six feet standing. It made me feel nauseous just looking at it. It was too tall, and its face was wrong. It looked humanoid, the same way we recognize human faces as being human. I had that feeling like I was looking at a person, but it wasn't totally human. It reminded me of cat eye syndrome, but at least that is explainable. This wasn't. Anyway, I spent way too long being as close as I was to that thing as it stared at me, but I gunned it out of there and locked the hell out of my house when I got home, despite being around 20 miles away from where I saw it. I don't know what it was, but it freaked the F out to me.
and I went to bed yesterday as usual. I don't remember seeing or feeling anything out of ordinary prior to that, but what happened next was possibly the most real dream I've ever had, to the point that I'm not sure if it even was one. It all started with me waking up in the middle of the night, or at least I thought I woke up. Next, I saw a very bright, cold white light coming out the window. It wasn't focused like a flashlight would be. More as if there was a very bright light bulb, and it was getting more and more bright. At some point, I felt that my ears started ringing. I was scared shitless, to be honest, but just froze in bed and stared at the light. I closed my eyes because it was getting painfully bright, and then there's like a gap in my memory. Maybe I fell asleep, but the next thing I remember is what I would call the second part of this dream. So here I wake up again, only to see that I'm no longer in my bed, but instead lying on some kind of a table with two literal aliens standing just next to me. Here I would like to say that I couldn't move anything besides my head, and even that was pretty difficult. Also, the table certainly was a little too short for me, because my feet were dangling over the edge. Now about these beings, their skin was very pale and kind of yellowish, almost like a corpse skin would look like. They had no hair whatsoever and were completely naked. Their eyes were just sort of plain gray color and only a little bigger than regular human eyes. Their heads were bigger than human heads too, but not like in those cliché descriptions. Ears were kind of pointy and protruding out. Their height was about five feet tall, I'd say. They had very narrow shoulders, lanky arms and legs. But what stood out is that their bellies were huge. Think like a beer belly on a very fragile body. The room was well lit. The walls looked like they were made of some really dark metal, and in the corner on the right stood what I would describe as a see-through bathtub filled to the top with what looked like sausages, and to make it weirder, there were two of these aliens sitting in that bathtub and staring at me. And oh God, the stench! It felt like something had died and was rotting in there. Next, one of the humanoids standing next to me had this thing in its hands. Best I could describe it as a starfish, but it was dark brown. The alien lifted my t-shirt off and placed that starfish thing on my belly. It felt like it attached itself to me. It was kind of slimy and overall felt disgusting. Right after doing that, it left the room through the entrance that was behind me. I couldn't see where it led. The three remaining aliens just kept staring at me without saying or doing a thing. Or doing a thing, after a while, I started feeling dizzy and as if I was about to vomit. I can't tell why. Maybe it was the stench, but a few minutes after the alien came back and took the starfish thingy off me, I passed out almost immediately after. Then I woke up in my own bed. No signs of aliens anywhere. My stomach looked as if nothing happened to it, but I still felt pretty sick. I had breakfast, and in a few hours I think the feeling simply went away. I was out at my grandparents' house, hunting coyotes, as usual, this time of year. I was hiking through my next-door neighbor's land to get to the wood-covered land in the back. While I was hiking, I got the feeling I was being followed by something to my right. I stopped and switched the red tint on my headlamp to my spotlight, but didn't see anything. Then I switched back to my headlamp and pulled my rifle back up and continued my hike. It was 6.15 a.m. and the sun was just coming up. I was sitting in a hide I'd made the day before. That's when I saw something behind a group of trees on my left. It was crouched. I raised my rifle, looked through my scope, and froze when I saw the creature staring back at me. I panicked and fired a shot off. That's when it stood up and took off. Deeper into the woods. I sat there probably another 25 minutes before I decided it was safe to head in and did so. Later that day, I grabbed my grandfather, and we both went out to where I had seen the creature when it stood up on two legs and took off. We measured where I had seen it, and it was roughly seven, one-half feet tall. To this day, I'm terrified to go out at night or in the early morning hours.
I was staying at the Marriott Hotel 6th floor in Huntsville, Alabama at the Space and Rocket Center. At 5.40 a.m. on Feb 24, 2009, I went on the balcony to drink my coffee as the room was too stuffy and hot. I was out there just thinking and staring off at the woods when something caught my eye. After refocusing on it, I realized there were legs, then arms. Then I could clearly make out his face. The creature stood six, seven feet tall and was staring directly back at me. It seemed to have fine hairs all over gray color hair that got more black as the hair got closer to the skin. The tips of the hair were much lighter. The face, lips, lids, etc. were more of a very dark brown. It stood very erect, was very muscular, and did not seem to have the ape-like protruding mouth and nose, but more flat-faced human-like. After 30 seconds, he started rocking back and forth. I then realized this was moving and could in no way be mistaken for a deer or bear or anything else. This was a fully erect ape-like animal that seemed to want me see him. He was rocking back and forth from side to side. After the initial 30 seconds, he rocked for about 10-12 seconds, then stood and stared at me. I was on the sixth floor, about 120 yards away, in decent lighting due to hotel lights and street light behind loading area of hotel. He then would stare back, then he would remain face forward, with feet only about two feet apart, would lean over to his left, with his right arm would start pulling bark off a very large pine tree. It looked as if someone were in a sawing position. Then he would stand up, stare at me, then rock, and then pull bark. This was done in that order three times over a five-six minute period. After five minutes of reverifying what I was looking at, I felt this creature was docile and smooth moving. I decided I would try and get a closer look. As I opened the sliding glass door, he stared, and I stared back. I ran out of the hotel room, and there was security in our hall, laying the morning news at the hotel room doors. I asked him to come with me and asked for backup since he had no gun. We ran around the corner outside. As we were running, I finally got the nerves to tell him what I saw. We get to the reference points I had chosen, and there were a lot of fresh bark removed from the large pine tree. I tried to pull bark from it to no avail. It was too hard. I am six feet four, three hundred pounds. I went back after seven a.m. light. I did notice what looked like scat. It took the form of explosive diarrhea and looked like a hundred birds had pooped in a small area, like in a shotgun pattern, heavy in the middle and lighter to the outside perimeter. I put a large handful in a Marriott laundry plastic bag. It looks like feces and digested berries and seeds. It was dry, although it had rained the night before. One of the Marriott employees saw two large footprints, more like deep indentions in the pine straw. I took off my shoe and placed my foot in it, and there was about a one-inch area all the way around my foot in order to fill the indention. Something very heavy had to make these indentions. I tried, and I am 300 pounds and could not. I am 100% positive of the above description. I watched this clearly for five, six minutes. My encounter occurred twenty or so years ago, way before what I saw even had a name. My encounter with what you call Dogman happened one afternoon as my family and I were returning home from shopping in town. I was living in a little town in East Texas at the time, and we lived about ten solid minutes from any real signs of civilization. The town itself at the time had a population of around five hundred and it took ten minutes of dirt road driving just to get to the gas station general store. The nearest town was called Lufkin in its population, and its population at the time was around thirty-zero. We were heading home, and we were on the first part of the longest dirt road we had to travel down. There were several large hills that would make your stomach churn if you hit them too fast. We had just gone over the first one of them on our journey home. When I saw something up ahead, it at first, I thought it was a deer. It was large and brown, and was jumping over a barbed wire fence on the right side of the road. It leapt over the barbed wire fence and managed to not only clear the fence, but landed roughly in the middle of the road. This already made me perk up a little. 
as that was an impressive jump, even if it was a deer. As we got closer, whatever this was took another impressive lunge and made its way to the other side of the road, just shy of the barbed wire fence on the other side. It never stopped, but continued up the embankment. I could swear that as it propelled itself up the side, it looked back at us, over its left shoulder, as if it were deciding who what we were. Not sure. I was awoken by strange noises, which I thought may be coyotes, but after I was awake for a few seconds, I realized that I had never heard those screams before. In the next few seconds, all the dogs in the neighborhood went crazy. My dogs, which were located right outside my bedroom, were barking horribly. I was sure we were going to get complaints from all the neighbors. I had never heard my dogs bark so loud before. But after a few minutes, I went back to sleep. I had to get up early. That morning when I woke up, I asked my mom if she heard the dogs barking. She said that she hadn't, but my father did, and that he had said it must have been a bear because he smelt such an awful smell. After questioning my father, he had said that he had assumed that he had smelt a bear, but after thinking about it, he admitted that he hadn't smelt that exact smell before. When I went outside to check my dogs, they were guarding the fence and refused to come down. Nobody in my family actually saw Bigfoot, but from what I have read and other reports, I believe there are some similarities. On September 12, 2015, while I was standing in the middle of my front yard waiting for my family to exit the van, to my right at 3 o'clock comes what looked like a jet black version of the Jack Skellington, an animated character, except the head looked like your typical gray alien head. There's a cement path that winds down into a fountain with surrounding benches and opens up into a playground, garden, and shed area. Up the cement path comes the black stick man and marches across the lawn very swiftly, going about twice as fast as a human would walk and its height was over seven feet tall. It came across the street under the street light onto my parents' gravel driveway and passed on the far side of the van. Then it continued straight down the gravel driveway and onto the side of our house. I got the impression it was very strong physically. When it had gone behind the gate, the doors to the van were opening and my sister was the first one out. I shouted, did you see that? And she said, it was all black. This confirmed my sighting. The only thing we could do was make sure our doors were locked. I haven't seen or heard anything since this incident. I saw a lot of weird stuff as a kid. One of the things was this long, super thin tube, jointed black robotic like arm that would jut out from behind a certain road sign. On our routine weekend drive to the shore to visit my grandpa when he was still alive, we would come to a turn in the road right before we made a lift onto his street. I saw a long, thin, insect-like, robotic-like arm come out from behind the street sign and make a grab for our vehicle. It shocked me. The next several times we went to visit him, though, nothing happened. One day, when I was in my early teens, I saw the exact same thing again, coming out from behind the same road sign. Freaky and pointless, but still made me question my reality. My name is Jack, and I was a government worker sent by the U.S. administration to track down a Bigfoot that had escaped from a CIA science experiment. I was a seasoned tracker, and I'd been chosen for the job because of my years of experience in the deep woods. As I ventured deeper into the forest, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. The trees were thick, and the shadows seemed to stretch on forever, and as the hours ticked by, my unease turned to outright fear. It wasn't long before I caught my first glimpse of the Bigfoot. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. A towering creature with matted fur and sharp claws. It seemed to be watching me, studying my every move with a keen intelligence that I hadn't expected. At first I thought that I could capture the Bigfoot alive and bring it back to the scientists who had created it. But as the days wore on, I began to realize that the creature was too powerful for me to handle. And then the attacks began. 
The Bigfoot seemed to be hunting me, stalking me through the woods with a ruthless determination. I was no match for its strength and agility, and I knew that my only hope was to outsmart it. But as I delved deeper into the mystery of the Bigfoot's origins, I discovered a document that unrevealed a sinister truth. The scientists who had created the creature were not working for the U.S. government, but for a secret organization with its own agenda. They had betrayed me and the, and the entire nation, and now I was caught in the middle of a deadly game of cat and mouse. In the end, I found out that CIA caught Bigfoot and jailed him. This experience left me shaken. I wanted to expose this secret organization. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to the story. The scientists had hinted at the existence of other experiments, other creatures that they had created and released into the wild. I couldn't ignore this knowledge, and so I began to dig deeper, determined to expose any other secrets that the government might be hiding. It wasn't long before I stumbled upon something that chilled me to the bone. The scientists had been experimenting with human DNA, splicing it with that of animals to create hybrid beings that were stronger, faster, and more intelligent than any human. And they had released these creatures into the wild, hoping to study their behavior and learn from them. I knew that I had to act fast before the hybrids could cause any more harm. But the scientists were one step ahead of me, and they had set a trap that I couldn't escape. One day, while I was going to work, a dark black van parked outside my home. To cut the long story short, I was captured, taken to a secret facility deep in the heart of the forest, and subjected to experiments of my own. They wanted to see if they could create the ultimate hybrid, combining the strength and agility of the animals with the intelligence and cunning of a human. For weeks I was poked, prodded, and injected with all manner of strange substances. I was given drugs that heightened my senses, and I could hear the creatures outside my cell pacing and growling in frustration. But despite everything they did to me, I refused to break. I knew that if I could just hold out long enough, someone would come looking for me. And sure enough, after what felt like an eternity, I heard the sound of gunfire and the unmistakable voices of my fellow rescuers, the just man at the U.S. government. I emerged from the facility a changed man, scarred by the horrors that I had endured. But I had also emerged stronger, smarter, and more determined than ever to uncover the truth and bring the scientists to justice. And as I walked away from the facility, leaving behind the horrors of the deep woods, I knew that I had found my true calling, to fight against the shadows and the secrets that threatened to consume us all. I wanted to share something I experienced in 2018, which, after reading some of the descriptions here, made me think posting would be a good idea. Maybe someone can comment on whether this fits the profile or not. This happened in Urbana, Illinois during spring 2018 around 8 p.m. I was driving an SUV through a residential area, 30 miles per hour, with moderate street lighting. I was coming back home from grocery shopping and turned a corner into the usual street. After driving one block, I saw something similar to a large white silver dog figure suddenly run towards the right front wheel of my vehicle. I gauged its size to be substantially larger than that of a German. Shepherd with an unusually bright hide, I braked quickly in fear of having run over it. Within seconds, I got off the car and performed a quick check. No signs of any injured animal. No nearby rustling into an unkempt garden next to where it all happened no animal crossing the road. This took less than five seconds. Then I paused and saw the same figure two blocks away from where I was, looking at me intensely for about 30 seconds. I looked back to the tire in my vehicle an instant, and it was suddenly gone when I checked again. All happened in less than a minute. After this, I drove around several blocks without signs of any dog or similar animal, nearby for about 10 minutes. Estimating the distance and time between events, I am certain that it is not feasible for a dog, much less such a large one, to run that quickly that distance, particularly without seeing it under street lighting.
I had been a park ranger for years, and I thought I had seen it all. But one night, deep in the heart of the forest, I encountered something that shook me to my core. I was on my nightly patrol, checking on the park's inhabitants and making sure everything was running smoothly. That's when I saw it. A dark figure lurking in the shadows with two glowing eyes that seemed to pierce through the darkness. As I got closer, I realized it was a Bigfoot, but not like any I had ever seen before. It was taller than any man I had ever seen, with broad shoulders and long arms that hung down past its knees. Its fur was a deep dark brown, almost black, and it seemed to shimmer in the moonlight. But it was the eyes that really caught my attention. They were a bright, glowing green, and they seemed to look right through me. I froze, unsure of what to do next. The creature let out a low growl, and I could feel the vibrations of its voice in my chest. I took a step back, but it didn't seem to be aggressive. It just stood there, staring at me with those eerie, glowing eyes. After a few moments, the Bigfoot turned and vanished into the forest. Leaving me alone in the dark, I reported the sighting to my superiors, but they didn't believe me. They said it was just my imagination or that I had seen a bear or a trick of the light. But I knew what I had seen. That Bigfoot was real, and it was out there lurking in the shadows of the forest. And I couldn't shake the feeling that it was watching me, waiting for its chance to reveal itself once again. I am a highway, a Native American, born and raised in a small village deep in the forest. I've always been at home in the woods, but I never imagined that one day I would be fighting for my life against an unknown creature. It happened on a dark and stormy night. I had been out hunting for food when I heard a strange noise. At first I thought it was just the wind, but then I saw it, a creature unlike anything I had ever seen before. It was large and hulking, with eyes that glowed in the darkness. It moved with an eerie grace, and I knew instinctively that it was not something I wanted to mess with. But before I could even think of what to do, the creature attacked me. It came at me with a fury, its claws slashing through the air. I fought back as best I could, using my bow and arrows to try and fend it off, but it was no use. The creature was too powerful, and it overpowered me easily. Just as I thought it was all over for me, the creature suddenly stopped attacking. It looked at me with its glowing eyes, and then it simply disappeared into the darkness. I was left lying on the forest floor, shaken and confused. What was that creature, and why had it attacked me? And why had it suddenly stopped just as it seemed like it was about to finish me off? For weeks after the attack, I searched the forest for any sign of the creature, but I found nothing. It was as if it had never existed in the first place, but I knew that I had not imagined it. The wounds on my body were proof enough that something had attacked me that night. Years passed, and I continued to live in the forest, always on the lookout for any sign of the creature that had nearly killed me. But it never appeared again, and I was left with nothing but my confusion and fear. To this day, I still wonder what that creature was and why it had attacked me. Was it simply defending its territory, or was it something more sinister at play? I may never know the truth, but I will always remember that dark and stormy night, and the creature that left me shaken and confused. I have debated posting this because I don't know if it's classified as paranormal or just a weird event. This event happened around November 2022, and it was 8 p.m. I was by myself at the entrance area of the school. My dad and I go to evening or night school. I'm studying computer science, and my dad studies mechanical engineering. At that time, I had the three first periods free because my teacher was sick, and I was hanging out at my dad's class when I saw that the break was coming up after it. I had class, and because of the distance, I decided to cross the campus so I won't be late to class. The break was ten minutes, and it took eight minutes to cross the campus at a normal pace. But due to my osteoarthritis, sometimes my legs are heavy and my walking is slow. 
That day was a day that my legs were heavy and my osteoarthritis was flaring up and my pace was very slow. So at 8 p.m., I was waiting for the bell to ring signaling the first break and I was sipping my hot chocolate from my thermos after having gone to the school cafeteria to get some ice cubes to put in because it was too hot. I was about to start scrolling through my phone since I was by myself and I felt very on edge. I was coming down from a week-long anxiety attack. I'm thinking it was because of that I felt on edge. To my left, there's this entrance door that leads to the second school on campus. My old high school, and where I was about a few minutes ago, since my dad's class is located in the basement of that building. Outside that building, there's a lamppost, and I turned to see it. A second after my eyes set on it, I noticed it was flickering. I thought nothing of it, thinking that it must be bugs flying around it, or because of what is happening with the energy crisis, our town is lowering the voltages, causing that flickering, as they did during scene lockdowns. Hence why I don't think it's paranormal, but what makes me post this here is how the flickering and the black that appeared in between it started becoming bigger and bigger and bigger every time. Three times flickered, and the third time the black spot was very big. Then there was an oomph sound from everywhere and nowhere at the same time before almost the entire campus was dived into darkness. Everything was dark except the classes. I could see the lights from the space under the door. The darkness lasted for maybe two or three minutes. I jumped up and walked as fast as my legs would allow to the cafeteria to ask the lady behind the counter and the cleaner that was with her chatting if they were okay. To get to them from where I was, it would take me a minute tops. But when I entered the cafeteria, the lights came back on, and when I asked, they said there was no power outage. Confused, I walked back to the bench I was sitting at, and everything was normal. The bell went off, and a break ensued. But in the minutes of darkness, it was completely silent, and I felt dread and on edge, even a bit of fear. I'm used to power outages from living on an island growing up that had many times run out of power throughout the winter, so I always carry a flashlight with me, and I make sure my phones always have flashlights. What was that darkness? Why was I the only one to live through it? I asked my dad, and he said there was no power outage. Same answers from fellow classmates and my mom when I asked them, any theories? I was target shooting. I had set up my targets and was just getting ready to begin my first string. A sudden high-pitched warbling sound began nearby. I had my ear, muffs on to protect my ears from the rifle blast, but lesser noises could still come through. When I first heard the noise, I thought it was an elk, but thought to myself that it was the wrong season for elk to be bugling. I turned in the direction of the sound and saw a large, hairy, erect humanoid figure standing on the other side of the road, about 80 feet away. I was immediately shocked at the sight, but I knew it meant me no harm. It could have easily slipped up behind me and wrung my neck before I even knew it was there. I couldn't understand why it just stood there, looking at me. As I began to change my position, it called out again with a shorter and less intense squeal. I saw no exterior sexual organs, probably because I spent the entire time looking at the face, wondering what was going to happen. I think it was a male, though, because it acted male. I could easily be wrong. It stood there looking at me for about 30 seconds, I think, before it turned and stepped into the brush. Afterwards, I had to let my nerves settle down for a while before I could even attempt to shoot. I kept looking at the spot I had seen it and tried to estimate how big it had been. As nearly as I can figure a guess, it was about seven. One half feet tall, covered with long, dark brown hair, except for a few white hairs across the shoulders, similar to gorillas and some older men. The arm seemed too long, extending almost to the knees. It made no noise as it entered the brush, passing through the foliage as quietly as if it were a ghost. When I was about seven or eight, I had a disturbing encounter with some kind of creature or entity. 
I lived in the Appalachian mountain range of Pennsylvania. It was November, around when daylight saving time occurred. I remember it was supposed to be a school day, but since the snow was so heavy, the buses were not able to drive out in the morning, so school was canceled for a snow day. I was so excited to spend the rest of the day outside in the snow. We had an acre of property going quite far back into the woods. I was walking deep into the forest to a small frozen pond past my property line. All of a sudden the woods went dead silent. No birds, no wildlife scurrying around, absolutely nothing. I remember thinking it was strange but kept walking to make it to the pond. I should have turned around right then and there but was just a naive little kid. After I reached the pond, everything was still completely silent, and the hairs on the back of my neck felt like they were rising. I started to get frightened, but I didn't know why. I felt like something really bad was going to happen to me if I didn't leave at that moment, so I decided to run back home. As I arrived to my backyard, I realized it was so late, and the sun was actually setting. My mom came running outside, asking where I was literally all day, and to never ever disappear like that ever again. None of this made sense to me, because I had only been outside for about 20 minutes. I left my house with my snow gear on at around 10 a.m., right after getting the snow day call. It was now almost 8 p.m., meaning I had been gone for around 10 hours. I have no idea what happened and how I had been gone for such a long period of time. I remember only being out there for such a short period of time. I don't know if this was a skinwalker encounter or even a wendigo encounter. Has anyone else had this happen to them? Was it some kind of creature? I didn't see anything at all while out there. I didn't lose track of time and I didn't fall and hit my head or anything. What do you think happened? Please let me know in the comments. My brother, Colby, and I had plans to go shooting squirrels that afternoon, so we chose our favorite spot. We packed all of our gear and headed out. It was a nice day, not a cloud in the sky. The squirrels will be everywhere today, Colby. We pulled up to the bottom of the clear cut and unloaded. The clear cut we're in is a good five acres. We made our walk to the top where we usually turn around and head back for the truck. Of course, my brother and I were firing away on the walk up at squirrels the whole time. We both heard it, but we didn't say anything until it did it again. The sound was close to 70, 5 to 100 yards away, across a little creek and up a slope. Up in the timber, we could hear something hitting two rocks together and wrestling around, making noise. You could tell this was no squirrel, but something large and heavy. We could hear its heavy footsteps make thuds in the ground. This went on for three minutes before we turned and went the other way quickly as possible. Colby and I both felt that something was watching us that day. We'll be back for him later. Not to mention the excellent squirrel hunting. Hey all, I have worked overnight at a nursing home for about three years now. During my time here, we've probably had 60-plus people pass. I've noticed that sometimes, when certain strong-willed people pass, there is some sort of electrical disturbance that happens. I used to think it was just a coincidence, but it has happened like eight-plus times since I've been working overnight. It can last up to two weeks after someone passes. Some examples. One lady passed it around 9 p.m., there's a door that leads outside two doors down from a room. The door is always locked and requires a number combo to unlock. The door's silent alarm tripped at 11.30 p.m. The door alarms only go off if someone opens it. After 10, it's just overnight crew and we stick together. We checked it out and there was no one there. It happened two more times a few days apart. A man passed near the front of the building. The silent alarm for the front door went off every night at around 2 a.m. It happened for about a week and then it stopped. One lady passed at 12. We were watching TV and all of a sudden it felt like a shock wave passed through the building. The lights in the TV area flickered off and on for a quick second. The TV turned off and turned back on. I joked that maybe that lady had passed. 
We checked on her, and she had just passed. Her body was still warm. Her neighbor's TV had also turned on and was on a static channel. Each room has a button on the wall that sends an alarm to the caregivers. We have had those go off multiple times in rooms where people have recently passed. Always freaks us out when it happens. To this day, I haven't seen anything but too many electrical disturbances happen close to someone's passing for it to be a coincidence. Has anyone else experienced any stuff like this? I grew up in southern Georgia in the woods and swamps hunting and hanging gaily. Fast forward 20 years. I'm on my lease hunting property near Whitmire, South Carolina. I found it strange that the old guys in the club would never ever hunt alone in these woods. I normally carry a 30 aught 6 rifle while in the woods. One evening it was getting late, 20 minutes or so maybe before dark. I'm watching some small ponds sitting over a road in the tall pines. I'm in my climber maybe 10 feet or so up in the tree. I love the woods but hate heights. The woods are loud but then very quiet. Okay, I thought. I was just hoping for a big buck. The next thing I hear is someone walking towards me in the small pines. But then they just stop. It's getting really dark. I start hearing deep groans where the walking had stopped. I'm thinking that it was a bear or a cat which would be very uncommon in this area. A big cat, maybe. But bears this far south is not normal. It gets very quiet again. I could see the small road well in the moonlight. The next thing, I hear the groans are immediately under me, almost beside me. Now the groans are becoming growls. Also, the odor was a bit overwhelming, just like a dead animal in the woods. I thought that a stinky animal was climbing on my tree and felt like I was going to be grabbed. I started moving a bit, trying to get my gun pointed down and lifting my feet. I was shaking because I was freaking scared. I could hear heavy breaths. I started yelling down, if you're a club member trespassing, I don't care. Just identify yourself or I'm gonna freaking start shooting. I thought someone was trying to get at me in the tree stand. I never heard another sound, and the foul odor was gone. I put my gun on my back and started slowly climbing down the tree. No more than two or three steps down the tree, I smelled that awful odor again. Then I heard a low groan. It was right in front of my face, but it was so dark that I saw nothing. It scared me so bad I stood up and jumped into the dark in the other direction. When I hit the ground, I rolled around, jumped to my feet, and ran down to the road. I ran as hard as I could to the gravel road where I could see well in the moonlight. At this time, I remembered that my buddy was down at the bottom of the road in the small pines where I put him in a big box stand. I didn't see his light, so I had to run down that road to get to the bottom by the rivers. He was down by the rivers. When I ran up to him, he said, Man, there's some weird dust going down. We need to go. We slowly walked together back up toward the gravel road. I heard someone walking on both sides of us all the way. I think my buddy was hearing it too. We didn't speak during the entire walk, maybe five to six hundred yards for some reason. I didn't feel my gun was going to help. I had hollered earlier threatened to shoot and whoever this was, they weren't scared. When we got to the gravel road, the entire atmosphere had changed. It was almost eleven o'clock at night by then. My buddy didn't talk much. We went back to camp and had some food. We went to bed. I could hear him rolling around all night, and I didn't sleep a wink. This story happened to a friend of mine. I share it here with his permission. My friend described what he experienced as follows. Year, 1986. There were no electricity or road in the village. The villagers had to go to uh, Ailege, a city of Turkey, to meet their needs. The road to the center was two, three kilometers from the village. It was necessary to be on this road at 4.30 a.m. to reach Elazig. There was only one car that goes to Elazig. The car was coming back like noon. The road used to go to Elazig was called Cinderazi. Demon Creek by the villagers and they thought that strange events were happening there and that it wasn't auspicious. 
Me and two of my friends started preparing at 3 p.m. to hit the road. The road we had to cross that included the Demon Creeks to reach Alasic was on our minds. First, we planned to cross the Ridgeway, then the Demon Creek and enter the highway that leads to Elazig. Afterwards, we hit the road. We lighted our cigarettes while being in a deep conversation. It was utter darkness. There wasn't even moonlight. We were slowly encouraging ourselves to cross the Demon Creek and thinking about that moment. We were getting close to the Demon Creek, but first we had to cross the ridgeway. The path was so narrow that two people could not walk side by side, and it was filled with big bushes. We were moving in. The single line. I was the last one in the row. The first guy in the row, named Kamal, suddenly stopped, and he mentioned that there was a black dog watched us without moving on the way. I thought to myself, it's one of our village dogs. My friends were very nervous. We were getting more scared of the stories that we had heard since our childhood. I was scared and started reciting Bismillah. It's a Muslim prey. The dog suddenly got out of the way and disappeared after moving a few meters away in the bushes. After the dog had disappeared, we thought to ourselves what the dog was doing there and continued to walk. After walking for one to two minutes, Kimiel suddenly stopped again and yelled. It's the same. Dog again, Hosen, before moving a few steps back. Three of us didn't know what to do because of confusion and fear. The dog was looking at us again. I recited Bismillah again. The dog stood up and vanished again at the bushes. My friend said, hi, let's go back and don't go there. And I said, we need to cross this road. If we don't, we will have to tomorrow. We will use this road for shopping and calm them down. Then we continued to our path. My friends were scared. Of course do I. We were talking about why did the dog appear at us again. I tried to calm them down by saying it's just a common dog and following us. We continued to our path. We couldn't believe our eyes what we had seen after three five minutes. A cold black goat was standing on the road like blocking the way. We were so scared. We started to pray and recite Bismillah. The goat suddenly disappeared. Disappearing of the goat made me comprehend that these events weren't ordinary at all. And we got scared seriously, but going back was unnecessary. I calmed my nerves and went to the first row of the line, and I backed my friends. I was both praying and continuing our route. It was only a sharp corner left for Demon Creek. We were shocked when we finished crossing the sharp corner. What we had seen was indescribable. Long white as snow, shining silhouette shaped mass. Whatever, it was obvious that it had arms and legs, but its face was ambiguous, and so it started to create sounds of rumble, scream, crying. We closed our ears with our hands. We were throwing ourselves out of fear and flapping on the ground. In the same time, there was blindly shining. I started to recite my known prayers. My friends were yelling, cursing, and they didn't know what they were doing. I was thinking about how to escape this situation and staying calm. I dragged my friends out of that incident. The screaming voices turned into laughter while we were escaping from there. The laughter echoed in our minds. We head back to the village, but we didn't know how we could come back. At the entrance of the village, there was the house of Kimo. When Kamal's parents saw us, they couldn't believe their eyes. They said, What's the matter with you? You have paleness in your face. Mm. We couldn't speak, trembling continuously, make noises like dummies. They informed our relatives. They also came here. They tried to grasp with the mind the situation. I rest for a while and drank some water and told them the story. The villagers were stunned. They told us to thank God that you could come in one piece. We thought that we saved ourselves, but from sunrise to sunset, for forty days, we had heavy headaches, skin rash, huge herpes in our lips. Late fall, 2010. In northern Canada, I went deep into the wilderness with my father and my eldest brother to hunt for moose. We left in the early morning, just before sunrise, trying to cover as much distance as possible before nightfall. We traveled winding rivers and had to repeatedly portage over rapids all day. 
we decided to set up camp just over halfway to our destination. My father figured that we'd make the rest of the journey tomorrow. Well, when everyone bedded down for the night, I decided to go grab some firewood and relieve myself down by the bank of the river, just out of reach of the light from the campfire, out from the tree line about 15 yards away. I could hear rustling in the bushes. I watched the area where I heard the noise and focused on that spot. I felt kind of funny, dizzy, lightheaded, and I could smell this putrid stink like old milk or rotten food. Then I saw the trees start to morph and move ever so slightly and began to take, to take the shape of a head and slight facial features. My eyes began to adjust it to the darkness and along the tree line. I could hear this voice coming from there. I recognized it. The voice sounded like one of my relatives who had recently passed. The face took shape of my relative. Hello, they said, I've missed you. Come see me. I smiled and stepped forward a bit, but stopped to analyze the situation. My relative's face stopped smiling and became emotionless. The skin began to turn pale and peel away. Chunks of flesh from their cheeks began to fall away, and I felt shock and fear overwhelm my body. I couldn't make sense of it at all, so I started to back away and make my way to camp. I didn't realize at the time that I had been walking towards the voice, and I was further away from the firelight. The voice became angry and began shouting at me to come here, so I turned to run away. But as I looked back one more time, I saw the most disgusting thing I had ever seen. It was rotting flesh on gnawed bone, caved in eyes and a hollow chest cavity. This humanoid creature was tall and super thin. I ran as fast as I could, trying to yell for help. But the fear had made my voice quiet and raspy. I ran along the river bank, and I could hear the heavy breaths and the stomping feet from this thing right behind me. I made it onto the top of the river bank, but it grabbed a hold of my leg as I jumped. Up! I gripped and tore the grass, trying to lift myself and yelled as loud as I could. Then finally my voice came back, and I yelled that someone has my leg. My brother woke up and ran over to where I was. Then he pulled me up and took me over to the fire. I was terrified, trying to explain what I saw, and that it looked like my relative, but not. I was trying to convince them that I wasn't seeing things, but my brother nodded his head and said I saw it too. I know. That solidified it. He acknowledged that it was real. We stayed up all night after that. Rifles loaded and close by, we packed up when the sun was coming up and went back home. We haven't shared that story with anyone out of fear of being labeled as crazy or liars, I've had nightmares and couldn't sleep for months afterwards. I would see things, dark figures looking into my window or hear whispers when I was walking home at night. Eventually I was seeing this dark figure daily. I went to medicine men shaman for help, but I've learned that the ceremonies only relieves it temporarily. Friends have given me everything from protection pouches to certain crystals. I found out that there's a strong possibility that I encountered a wendigo. I learned that if you encounter one and survive, it attaches itself to you like a parasite. I learned that it could only do this if it touches you, which it did. Ever since that night, I've been on edge when I enter any forest or wooded area, which sucks because I loved being outdoors and hunting and in nature. Now I always feel like I need to keep my back against something when I'm out in the wild. Anyways, make your own conclusions about this. I paid a price for being an ignorant child to the stories of old. They are real. I can attest to that. Stay safe, everyone. I am Ivan, a park ranger at Congaree National Park in South Carolina. I've worked here for years, and I've seen all sorts of wildlife, from black bears to alligators, but I never expected to encounter what I found one night in the heart of the park. It was a quiet night, and I was doing my rounds checking the trails and campsites. As I walked through the forest, I heard a strange noise. It was a low, guttural growl that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I shone my flashlight around, but couldn't see anything in the darkness. That's when I heard a loud snap and turned to see a massive creature standing before me. It was a bipedal brown Bigfoot, towering over me at nearly eight feet tall. Its eyes glowed in the beam of my flashlight. 
and I could see its powerful muscles rippling beneath its fur. I tried to back away slowly, but the creature took a step forward, blocking my path. It bared its teeth, growling menacingly. I knew that if it wanted to, it could easily overpower me. I was frozen with fear, stuck in place with no to go. Just when I thought I was done for, the creature suddenly turned and ran off into the forest. I stood there, trembling and trying to catch my breath, wondering what had just happened. I had encountered a bipedal brown Bigfoot, something that I'd never thought I would see in my lifetime. Over the next few days, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I heard strange noises and saw shadows moving in the trees. I knew that the creature was still out there, somewhere in the forest, and I was never sure when it would make its presence known again. I couldn't keep my encounter a secret, and soon word got out. People started coming to the park, hoping to catch a glimpse of the creature. I tried to warn them that it was dangerous, but some were determined to find it. In the end, it was best that the creature remained a mystery, a legend of the forest that only a few lucky people had encountered. I continued to work at the park, but I never forgot about that fateful night when I came face to face with a bipedal brown Bigfoot. It all started one night a few years ago when I was hanging out with a guy friend of mine. Let's call him Dan and his cousin. Dan and I had really come to bond over some of our strange beliefs and experiences. The story I'm about to tell wasn't the first foray for either of us into things of an otherworldly nature, but for me it was one of the most significant and had a lasting impact on how I view these things. I was living in Chicago at the time and working at a bar somewhat near downtown. If you believe in superstitions and fairy tales, it would be easy to assume that strange things only happen to people deep in the woods or in remote locations, and that a city such as Chicago would be mainly devoid of supernatural or otherworldly experiences. It's easy to assume that densely populated areas wouldn't exactly be a breeding ground for this kind of strange activity, but you would be wrong. On this particular night, it was slow at work, and Dan and his cousin just happened to be in the area. He texted me to ask what my plans were, so I suggested they come to my place for a quick drink before we closed, since it was already nearing 2 a.m. I finished my side work just as they were arriving, ten minutes till two. So we all had a quick drink and took off to find another bar that was still open. But I think it must have been a Sunday or something because everything in the area was closed. So we decided to head back to our neighborhood on the far north side of the city. As we were deciding what to do, Dan casually mentioned that he knew a liquor store in the northern suburbs that was open till 3 a.m. every night. So we devised an impromptu plan to grab some beers and have a late night stroll on the nearby beach. I would like to mention that this particular beach was about a 10-minute walk from where I was living at the time and had a bike trail with a park that I would often rollerblade or walk through. When we got to the park, everything seemed normal. Both the parking lot and the park itself seemed empty, and we assumed the beach to be empty as well, as everything was perfectly quiet and still. By this time, it was about 3 a.m., so we didn't expect anyone else to be there. As we were getting our beers out of the car, I noticed it was a full moon that night. We often went on nighttime adventures in the suburbs when we were bored, although never to this particular beach, and even on college campuses, we barely ever ran into anyone. But as we walked through the park, I noticed how still and quiet everything was. As soon as we stepped foot onto the sand where the beach started, something shifted. The energy changed, and we started hearing laughter coming from where? It sounded like it was just out in front of us a ways, just right there, out in the water. But no one was there. It was a clear night, and with the full moon you could see for literally miles in every direction. There was no one there. But yet the laughing persisted, and it sounded like two voices, a man and a woman. And you could clearly hear them in the water, splashing and playing and laughing and talking but there was just simply nobody there. At this point, we were all actively scanning up and down the beach and literally asking each other, Yo, are you guys hearing this? It sounded like they were out there playing in the waves in the middle of the night. 
laughing and talking, but we couldn't make out what they were saying, and we simply couldn't see anyone out there besides ourselves. We all agreed that it was weird, and maybe we should have simply taken it as a sign to leave, but we ended up deciding to simply ignore it and headed to the opposite end of the beach. Maybe they're out there skinny dipping and they don't want us to see them. I offered this as a possible solution, but I think I was just trying to rationalize what didn't make rational sense, so we ignored it. We walked to the complete opposite end of the beach which may have been roughly the size of a football field, but when we got there we noted that the voices had not changed volume. It still sounded like they were out in the waves right in front of us, so we ignored it even harder. We opened some beers, put it out of our minds, and frankly didn't think too much of it for a while as we talked about random things, and I took pictures of the moon or the water. This went on for about 20 minutes, and we weren't thinking too much anymore about the voices or the laughter until it suddenly stopped. The sudden absence of sound made us immediately uneasy, mainly because what the F just happened. Why did the voices stop? Did they get sucked into an undertow? Are they out there in the waves drowning? We all looked at each other with the same question. What the F do we do? Here I am on the beach in the middle of the night, where we're not supposed to be, drinking beers, and now there's people potentially drowning. What do you even do in this scenario? Call the cops. Run out and try to save them. All I can assume is that in this moment, we were all contemplating these same horrifying scenarios when I saw movement out of the corner of my eye down to the other end of the beach. A wave of relief washed over me, thinking at first that it might be these people coming up on the beach. So without even thinking, I started to point and say, Look, there they are. It's two realizing at this moment they aren't people. It's two, dogs. And sure enough, we all see what seems to clearly be the silhouettes of two dogs trotting towards us down the beach. Now, this was a decent-sized beach, but these things were not simply walking. They were moving with some speed and managed to clear half of it in about as much time as it took me to process what they even were. And as they started to get closer, I started to notice that they had very large ears, tails, and paws. Holy few guys, I don't think those are dogs, I said. Those are coyotes or something, and they're coming right at us. Now I had seen coyotes in the area and knew they were no strangers to even densely populated areas. But seeing what appears to be two wild animals trotting towards a group of humans in the middle of the night is wildly disconcerting. At this point, they suddenly stopped in their tracks about halfway down the beach. They seemed to assess us for a moment, when all of a sudden I saw, with all clarity, the silhouettes of these two animals rise onto their hind legs and become instead the shapes of two people. Immediately, I turned around to my friends and exclaimed, Tell me you just saw that S. Yeah, said Dan, who looked terrified. They just stood up. That was all he had to say for me, to know that we had all seen the same thing. When we turned back to look, they were already gone, like they had simply disappeared into thin air. Dan's cousin said, we need to get the F out of here, and so we did. But it wasn't so much sheer panic as a sense of vague unease. We didn't run away screaming, we just simply quickly grabbed our things and started walking towards the exit. As we walked past the lifeguard tower, we noticed them as if they had simply materialized again. There they were, the two of them, a silhouette of a man and a woman against the moonlit sky, sitting atop the lifeguard tower. We all slowed our step as we noticed them. Should we say something to them? I asked aloud. I couldn't help myself. The curiosity was overwhelming. No, Dan's cousin whispered sharply at me. Dan grabbed my hand and dragged me onward. Don't say anything to them. Just keep moving. So we left. We got in the car silently. We took the short drive back to my apartment silently. We sat in the car quietly for a few minutes, smoking a cigarette. Okay, I said finally, breaking the silence. But we all experienced that S, right? Did we just see? Like werewolves or something? And in that few minutes, we rehashed the entire experience together, from the disembodied voices to the shape-shifting creatures. And although we agreed that we had all seen and experienced the same thing, we also noted that if we had been alone and seen something like that, we might have just written it off.
I thought it was my eyes playing tricks on me. Dan said until I realized you guys saw it too. That was basically the feeling we all had through the whole experience. As if we had tried to write it off until it was nearly staring us right in the face. But honestly, this wasn't my first experience with things of an otherworldly nature, and it seemed to me from experience that it's best to just let it go. So I did let it go. I got out of the car and went into my apartment and honestly just went straight to bed. Like I knew it was a strange thing we had all just experienced, but I really just hoped and chose to assume that that would be the end of it. And truthfully, I went to bed that night and slept like a baby. I never really felt like I was in danger or that something malicious had followed me. I thought that was the end of it, until I started having dreams about them a few weeks later. As it turns out, they had followed me and they wanted to talk with me. One night, a few weeks after our sighting of the strange shape-shifting creatures, I had a dream. I didn't know that it was a dream while it was happening. It all felt so real. It was like I remembered nodding off in bed. And then I came to somewhere else. When I came to, I found myself standing on an empty beach. I quickly realized it was the same beach where we had seen the creatures a few weeks prior. But I couldn't remember how I had gotten there. I just fell asleep in my bed and woke up on the beach. The transition was so jarring I started to panic, wondering if I had slept walked there. Or worse, if I was losing my mind. My unease grew as I realized the winds were blowing and the skies were dark as if there was a bad storm approaching. I thought about the things we saw on the beach that night, wondering if they had somehow led me here. As soon as the thought crossed my mind, I saw something. Black, inky, amorphous shapes rising out of the crashing waves of Lake Michigan. I worried that I had somehow disturbed some ancient lake spirits. As I watched the shapes rise out of the waves, they took the form of two large black dogs, each with glowing yellow eyes. They maintained this shape until they reached the beach, where they stood on their hind legs, and suddenly they were no longer dogs, but a man and a woman, strange, ethereal-looking people, with long black hair and the same glowing yellow eyes. They just stared at me, and I stared at them, and they stared at me. And I stared at them a little while more, until I finally managed to muster the words. What are you? They exchanged a baffled glance with each other. No, but like, what are you? The looks of confusion on their faces grew. In fact, it seemed like a mix of confusion and offense at the very question. In my dumbfounded state, I repeated the question a few more times. What are you? But they seemed either unwilling or unable to respond to it. So I asked more questions, different questions. Okay, if you can't tell me what you are, can you tell me where you came from? Like, have you always been on this beach? Do you come from a different realm? More looks of confusion? You can't even tell me where you came from. Like, when were you born? Do you remember being born? Suddenly the woman snapped at me. Do you remember being born? And suddenly I was the one who didn't know how to answer the question. Do you remember being a baby or an infant or even a toddler for that matter? She seemed thoroughly annoyed by my line of questioning. Well, no, of course not, I stuttered. No, of course not, she said. You don't remember that far back? Well, neither do we. But surely you must know something about your origins or where you came from. I asked he. I may not remember being born, but I have parents and family and doctors who were there to confirm when and where I was born. Well, we don't have any of that, she said matter, or factly, in fact, things like us. Well, we're the oldest things we know of. We don't have parents or grandparents to ask. We don't have anyone who came before us to ask where we came from. And frankly, we simply don't remember that far back. I was dumbfounded. I had no idea how to respond. So you want to know where we come from? She continued. Well, I can't tell you that for certain. All I can tell you is my opinions, my beliefs. I would say that we come from. I would say that it's the same God that created you that created us, that created all of reality. But the truth is, if God does exist, or some sort of creators to all of this, they quite simply are not around anymore to ask. 
but this is just my belief, and that's all I can give you. Feeling in a whirlwind from such a complex and unexpected response, I clamored for something to follow it up with. So, how old do you think you are exactly, or how far back do you remember? She sighed a deep sigh and started pointing around in various directions, saying things like, Do you see the water? You see the waves on the water? Well, yes. I said, obviously, I see the water. You see the beach, and the grass is growing on the sand dunes. Yes, I see the beach. Do you see the hills beyond the beach and the trees growing on those hills? Yes, yes, I see the hills and the trees. What does that have to do with anything? Well, she sighed, we're old. At least as old as the landscape itself, if not older. So as long as this has been here, we've been here. As long as the water and the beach and the hills have been here, we've been here. We're as old as the hills, you might say. At this point, I was exasperated. Okay, that's all cool and good for you and whatever. But what does that have to do with me? Like, what does that have to do with me? They were both silent for a moment. Surely there's some reason you sought me out right. Surely there's some reason you've approached me to tell me all of this. My silence. So... What does this have to do with me? Just then the man, who hadn't said anything to me the entire time, just sort of shrugged and said, I don't know. We just thought it might be nice to have a human to talk to for a change, you know. And that must have made me so angry that I woke myself up because the last thing I remember is yelling for a change from what? And then I was waking up in my bed and it was morning. I had more dreams of them after this. Most of them were vague, and I couldn't really remember much. When I told my friend Dan about this, I was surprised to hear him say that he had been having dreams about them, too. He didn't claim to remember having any specific conversations with them, just vague dreams of shape-shifting entities. But as for me, I did have one other dream where a conversation was had. In this dream, I was at work. In real life, I work as a server, but for some reason in this dream, I was a bartender. It was the same bar, however, that I was working at in real life at the time. It was a slow night. There were a few tables, but no one at the bar. I was contemplating stepping out for a cigarette when a woman walked through the front door. Immediately, she caught my eye. Something about her was dreamlike. The way she moved was ethereal. She had long, black, wavy hair that seemed to flow unnaturally, and she may have been wearing a fur coat. When she sat down and made eye contact with me, I immediately noticed her eyes. They were a bright, vibrant, and unnatural shade of yellow, almost as if they were glowing. I just knew as soon as I looked at her that everything about her was entirely strange. But I didn't know that this was a dream, and I didn't want her or any of the other customers to think I was crazy. So I greeted her as I would any customer. Hey, what's up? How's it going? Yeah, she said in a complete non squeakure So I've been really into werewolves lately. She slammed both hands down on the bar emphatically as she said the word werewolves, staring at me with wide eyes and a strange grin. I'm okay. I responded, her comments catching me off guard. Yeah, have you ever heard of werewolves? At this point, I was sure she was crazy. Or are cryptids. Have you heard of those? In my mind, I'm thinking, lady, is this your first day on planet Earth? Who hasn't heard of werewolves? But I just laughed uncomfortably and played along. Yes, I have heard of them. Why, okay, so you've heard of werewolves and cryptids and stuff. Cool? Yeah, I'm like really into that stuff. Like I want to know all of the folklore about these things. And I want to know what people think about these things. That's cool. Can I get you a drink? Honestly, I was just trying to hurry up and serve her so I could go out for a smoke. She ordered a beer. I poured it and handed it to her, and she continued on with her strange line of questioning. So have you ever seen anything like that? She asked as I handed over her beer. Like what? Like a werewolf? Yes, silly, like a werewolf. She made a playful smirk, because I just want to know. I want to know what people think about these things. Well, I was about to step out front for a quick smoke, if you don't mind. Maybe we can continue this conversation when I get back. 
At this point, I was honestly getting more than a little weirded out by her energy and her attempts at talking about some weird sis with me. Sure, she said. So I went outside, but as soon as I lit my cigarette, I turned around and she was standing behind me. I'm sorry, I just couldn't wait. I wanted to talk about it now. I don't want to freak you out. I'm just conducting some research, you know, trying to find out what people think about these things. I tried to steer the conversation politely back to her by flipping the question. Well, what do you think about these things? Do you believe in werewolves? I don't really know. I just want to know what you think. Like, I'm fascinated by the kinds of stories and myths people tell. The good, the bad, the ugly, I don't care. I just want to know. Do you have any stories? Any experiences? This went on a few more times with me trying to redirect the conversation and her directing it back at me until finally I told her firmly but nicely, look, I do believe in these things and I would love to have that conversation. I really would, but I'm at work right now and this isn't the time or the place, you know. Like I can't be standing out front smoking cigarettes and talking about this kind of stuff with people. I'm sorry. I just really can't talk about this stuff at work, that's all. That's okay, she said, I understand. I really should get going anyways. She smiled kind of a dejected smile and I suddenly felt a little bad for being so dismissive. Okay, I said. I'm sorry I can't talk more about that stuff right now, but I have to get back to work. Okay, she said. Have a good one, and she started to walk off down the street. As I walked back through the door, I stopped and, for some unknown reason, joked, Oh, by the way, you're my favorite cryptid. She winked at me, and as I was walking back through the door into the building, everything made sense. I realized this was a dream. I realized who she was and why she was asking these questions. And I turned back around and ran out the door as if I was going to confront her. But I woke up. I moved away from that apartment and from Chicago completely after that. I moved back home to Michigan. I still have strange dreams sometimes, but I'm not sure if those particular entities followed me or not. If I'm being honest, at the end of the day, they were pretty interesting to talk to. And I think if I got the chance, I would talk to them again sometime. So that's the story of how I met the Loop Guru, and they were pretty nice, actually. Hope you enjoyed reading it. If anyone has any insights or has experienced anything similar, I'd love to hear it. My theory is that these were not actually werewolves at all, but rather some type of fey entities. I'd love to hear others' thoughts. I was going with a friend up the canyon to test our super strong flashlight and see if we could light up a mountain. It was a snowy night and I was the passenger. We were driving for a while when I saw movement on the hillside next to the road, so I looked up and I saw something that looked like a naked figure with long legs get up and start running. It was the fastest I ever saw a living thing move. It quickly ran into the darkness away from the headlights. I pointed and yelled to my friend and he only saw a glimpse. He couldn't tell what it was, but he saw something, and this confirmed to me. I wasn't just seeing things. It just happened and scared me really bad, and I was hoping I could get some input from this subreddit for what I may have saw. Thanks! A few months ago, around 4 or 5 a.m., I had woken up to what sounded like my cat being attacked and dragged away into the woods. I got up to open the door to my tiny house and looked outside and called my cat. He didn't come and I didn't see anything. My fiance had gotten up and left for work at 3.45 a.m. Later that morning, I saw my cat Vishnu playing with my other cat Mavis. A couple of nights go by and I'm woken up to the sound being right out my door and it fading into the woods. This time I stayed in bed. I set up a deer cam to try and catch whatever it was making the sound but nothing was caught on the camera. Then, a few days later, my fiancé is sitting on the porch, relaxing at 11 p.m., and he looks over about four feet away. He sees this pale creature on all fours. He went to grab his pistol to confront it. It took off. 
He said he got a glimpse of its face, and the expression it had was like it was worried that it was seen. Ever since then, we have not heard or seen anything. I was working early one morning on a Wednesday. At that time, I'd been a police officer for a little over ten years. I was in a good mood that morning because I was expecting some potentially good news about an upcoming promotion. In fact, everyone was in a good mood that morning. I was eager to do my job and go home to my family. My day changed dramatically when the phone rang, though. It was an old friend of mine, and she had called me directly. She sounded exhausted and a little incoherent. When I asked her what was going on, she explained that she hadn't been sleeping. We'll call her Megan for this story. Megan told me that she'd been waking up every night from sounds coming from the basement of her house. At first she assumed it was rats or skunks or something. But then she said the previous night, the noises had gotten so loud that she was certain there was a person sleeping in her basement. Reports like that are never good to hear. It's a surprisingly common event where vagrants will break into someone's basement and live there for weeks on end, stealing from them and causing all kinds of damage. The real danger is if someone gains access to the main house Megan lived alone at the time, so I immediately agreed to come over and take a look. I wanted to make sure that whatever was happening in her basement would come to an end. She asked me to come later as she was going to work. It sounds odd, but she wanted me to hear what she was hearing. She said that the sounds never happened in the daytime, so if I came over at night, then perhaps I could catch the person, if it even was a person that was living in her basement. I agreed, but it left me feeling uneasy and concerned all day. That evening, she let me know when she was on her way home, and I went to meet her at her house. She offered to cook me dinner while we waited for the sounds to start back up. I was in an even better mood, as I had learned by that point that I'd gotten the promotion that I was after. So we had a little celebration. At around 10.30, I heard the first sound coming from downstairs. She stopped and told me to press my ear to the door, so I did. I could hear a fair amount of shuffling. It wasn't very clear what it was, but it was definitely too big to be a rat or a skunk. I told her that I was going to slowly open the door, but when I did, it made a loud sound that I could hear crashing in the basement. I ran down the stairs with my weapon drawn, but I stopped dead in my tracks when I switched the light on. What I found was what looked like a large nest of some kind. There were branches and feathers and dried leaves all piled together in the center of the room, and it stank like nothing I'd ever smelled before. The window was broken, so whoever it was had left. I told her to stay at my house for a few nights and then arranged for some trail cams to be put up in the basement so that we could catch whoever was down there and have sufficient evidence. After a few days, I went to retrieve the trail cams and watch the footage. Megan was sitting next to me at the time. What I saw completely blew my mind. A large animal with long, thin arms and legs climbed in through the window. It behaved similar to a large ape, only I'd never seen an ape like that before. It brought with it more items to add to the nest. I know for a fact that apes don't make nests. In fact, most animals of that size don't make nests. It walked on its two hind legs like a human, but was hunched over the entire time. It had a large rib cage and large ape-like hands, but I remember noting that it had no ears and seemed to have no color on its skin, apart from one large black spot on the back of its head. Megan was freaking out and asking me what to do. I had no answer, for I'd never encountered anything like that before. So I gave the footage to my superior. When he watched it, his eyes stretched wide. The next thing I knew, I had a non-disclosure agreement on my desk, and the footage was confiscated from my possession. Megan was also forced to sign so that she couldn't speak of it. She said that men with suits had come into her basement, and when they were done, there was nothing left, and her entire basement had been boarded up. She never really felt safe in her home, though, and wound up selling it a few months later. It was a sad day, as that home had been in her family for generations, but whatever security she once felt there had been stripped away by whatever creature had decided to nest there.
I was a ranger in St. Louis County, Minnesota. The year was 2007. A man in our staff went missing during his lunch break. He was a husband and father. We sent a search party out to locate him. We searched the area for about a day or so, but he was nowhere to be found. We even made inquiries to other nearby towns, but they had no information. We assumed he had wandered away from the area and may have perished. The family of this man requested his remains be found and buried. We honored this request. We had several months go by, and we put this man behind us. Then a strange occurrence happened one early evening in the fall. I was out on patrol, running radar on the roads. I was about two miles north of town, which is a rural area. I was doing my rounds, and I spotted a pair of eyes in the ditch. I thought it was a fox or something. I stopped my vehicle, stepped out. I wasn't expecting what I saw next. A dark, shadowy figure became now visible. It was hunched over, finishing off a deer. This deer was a simple four-point buck. The thing had just been killed and was eating it. That's not all. I was shocked at what followed. It stood back up, this thing on two legs, walking upright. It looked me in the eyes and quickly disappeared. The eyes were blood red. I watched this thing walk off into a nearby creek and disappeared immediately. I went back to the office and called my boss and told him when I saw him. He told me to stay there until he could get there. So I sat there staying in the office while my boss and another ranger wrote down everything they could about what I had to say. They searched for a few hours but could not find anything. I was scared to go out on patrol the next few days. It only happened one or two more times after this, and even then, that's probably too much. I ended up seeing it again in the area where I first saw it. It never acted aggressive, but it was always in that area. The final time it was winter and there was about 12 inches of snow on the ground. I saw it again. This was the last time. I was relieved when the spring came and I did not have to patrol that section any longer. Now, before I end my story, let me quickly tell you why I included the first part about the man missing after lunch. I believe that his spirit became disembodied and turned into this horrible, ghastly apparition that I saw, or otherwise known as a Wendigo. I believe that it's possible that his spirit, or him dying, turned into this creature that I saw. Of course, this is just a wild theory, but I cling to it because it makes sense to me. I would love to hear any comments or thoughts or even theories on what they think. Do you believe that he turned into a Wendigo? Is it possible that he died and his spirit was able to manifest as this being? I don't know. I worked as a police officer in the town of Nakagoshi's for around eight years. I loved it there. A lot of people don't see why I enjoyed it so much, but that town had really brought me peace after many rough years. That peace was completely disrupted one day, though. There are many trails in Nakagoshi's. Most of them are completely tucked away in thick trees and brush. It was my day off, and walking those trails was one of my favorite things to do. At the time I had been divorced, I'm ashamed to admit that I wasn't a very good father in those years. I hadn't seen my children in years, and I had made very little effort to be part of their lives. It's a terrible thing to admit to, and I have many regrets, but that's the kind of man I was at the time. I had picked out my trail for the day. It was one that I hadn't walked yet, and I decided I'd go exploring. For some reason that day my children were on my mind, I remember that it bothered me because it made me feel guilty. It was kind of a bummer to feel that guilt on my day off. In hindsight, I was probably thinking about them because some part of me knew that I was in imminent danger. The first thing I noticed was that the trail was very quiet, seemed unusual. Normally I'd come across at least one other person while on my walks. That day, I hadn't seen a single other soul. It didn't bother me too much, but it did tell me that I needed to be more vigilant for snakes and other dangerous creatures. I had stopped for a drink of water, and I was leaning against the wooden rail that lined the trail, when all of a sudden the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I hate that feeling so much. I don't really know why it happens to us, but it's never a good sign. 
I lowered my water bottle and listened carefully for any kinds of sound. I couldn't hear anything, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Suddenly the space around me felt way too quiet. I looked toward the direction I was going as I contemplated whether or not I should carry on with the trail or head back towards my car. I made the logical decision to head back towards my car. It wasn't far along the trail, so I knew it wouldn't take long to get to safety. As I walked, the only sound I could hear was the sound of my own footsteps, and it completely unsettled me. Then, something stopped me dead in my tracks. It was a light thudding sound, and it was coming from high up in the trees. I stopped to look. I scanned the trees, but heard and saw nothing. I decided to stay where I was for just a moment and listen. Then I heard the thought again, just to my left. It was as if something had landed in the tree. I looked up at the tree, which was covered in red and orange leaves. I focused hard on the leaves, searching for a large bird or maybe a squirrel. Then slow movement caught my eye. Something massive was stalking me. I couldn't see it clearly, but it had long limbs and it climbed through the branches sideways. It seemed to be keeping me in its sights as it moved gently through the leaves, barely rustling the branches. Then I saw part of its face. Two saucer-like eyes stared at me from between the branches. It seemed like minutes that we stared at each other. Not once did the creature blink. It seemed to be patiently waiting for me to look away. I was frozen with fear. I could hear nothing but the sound of my heart beating in my chest. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, more hikers stumbled upon me. They were noisier than I was. They had a Bluetooth speaker that was pumping loud hip-hop music, and they were laughing and joking. It scared the creature away. It took off along the trees, moving faster than any animal I'd seen before. Those other hikers will never know that their obnoxious behavior had saved my life that day. All I remember thinking was that I was going to die without ever seeing my children grow up. As soon as I got back to my car, I phoned my kids. That experience changed my life for the better. Still, I never want to be that scared again. It was a typical morning in Yellowstone National Park when the body of park ranger John was found. He had been on patrol the night before, but never returned to his post. The other rangers searched for him and eventually found him in a remote area of the park. But something was off. John's skull was missing, and his body had been brutally attacked. My name is Jack, and I'm one of the park rangers. I was tasked with analyzing the body and trying to figure out what could have caused such a gruesome death. As I examined the wounds, I couldn't help but think that they looked like they had been made by a large, sharp claw. I couldn't shake the feeling that this was the work of a creature similar to Bigfoot. I shared my findings with the rest of the park rangers, but they mocked me and said I was just seeing things. They reported the case as a murder to the police, but they said they were too busy to investigate. I was left alone with a body, and I knew I had to find out the truth. I decided to take matters into my own hands and ventured into the woods. I wanted to see if I could find any clues or evidence that would support my theory. As I walked deeper into the forest, I heard a loud roar in the distance. I froze in place, unsure of what to do. But then I saw it. A creature, unlike anything I had ever seen before. It was covered in fur, had a large, sharp claw, and stood at least eight feet tall. The creature roared again, and a buck ran past me, panicked. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was like something out of a nightmare. The creature then fled into the woods, and I was left standing there, in shock. I knew I had to tell the others what I had seen, but I didn't know if they would believe me. I was terrified and didn't know what to do. I eventually made it back to the ranger station, and I told them everything. But they still didn't believe me. They thought I was just seeing things, or that I was losing my mind. I was left feeling alone and isolated. I knew there was a creature out there that had killed John, and I was the only one who knew about it. I couldn't shake the feeling that the creature was still out there watching me. I knew I had to be careful, and I couldn't let my guard down. I was determined to find the truth and bring justice for John, but I couldn't shake the feeling of dread that followed me. 
knowing that I was the only one who knew the true horror that lurked in the woods of Yellowstone National Park. I'm a Coast Guard, old Navy tug brought into service to the USDS Creeker had a ghost of a Navy guy who died in the bilge from gas. Fast forward to a new used mechanic trying to fix one of the batteries and wasn't getting it quite right. A guy on the batter next to him said, No, you do it like this, and unscrewed apart, showing him how it was done. However, the other guy was in a Navy uniform, and we were at sea. He diapered shortly after talking. Lots of us had seen that Navy engineer in the past, but that particular coast I got off the boat at the next port call and refused to reboard. We left without him, not sure or whatever happened, but he never came back to the ship. We also had the screams of a lady that would happen during late shifts, enough that we always turned the boats aft away from the direction of the screams in case it was a civilian in the water. No woman aboard this ship. We would light up that section of ocean with high-powered lighting, but there was never anything there. We were told not to log the events. One time we paddled into a backcountry site that we like camping at in the fall. It's high on a rocky cliff, but has natural stairs up, so it's nicely protected from the wind and damp of the lake. One day we were walking around in the woods behind the site just to see what we see. There are lots of open spaces caused by exposed rock that create a natural trail. We weren't even that far from the site. All of a sudden we hear a short, low growl. We freeze. Neither of us were sure we actually heard it. We wait a minute, see and hear nothing, so we start walking again. A longer growl. Now the hair is standing up on the back of my neck. My instinct is to run, but I don't want to activate some animal's prey drive. We still don't see anything. My husband picks up a big stick and starts hitting trees and making lots of noise so we seem big. We slowly back away and walk calmly back to our campsite. Needless to say, we didn't sleep much that night. We never saw what it was, but our theory is that it was a coyote. We often hear them howling and yipping near there, and I've read they sleep in the open during the day. We pull into a state park campground to camp for a couple of nights. There was a line of trees separating our campsite from our neighbors, and our neighbors had a strap strung up between two of the trees with two blackened sausages hanging from hooks. Trying to ignore how weird that is, our neighbors greet us and say, Don't worry about the sausages. Our buddy got a trail camera, so we're trying to catch raccoons with it. Glossing over the fact that this trail cam was pointed right into our campsite. I had definitely had to keep this in mind when I got out of my camper to pee in the middle of the night. The sausages were still there the next morning, but I think eventually a ranger came by and told them to cut it out because they disappeared sometime during the day. I didn't like the weird vibes emanating from that spot, so we just ignored their presence for the most part. They were gone for most of the day, but came back to their enormous RV and generator right as we were thinking it would be peacefully quiet for the rest of the evening. The last morning... I wake up to the sound of a thousand crows circling us. I lay there for a while and then peek out and see a dead crow lying right in the same precise spot below where those black sausages had been hanging the day before. Every crow within a 100-mile radius was circling overhead, angrily cawing out during this crow funeral. Now, I've been on the wrong side of a crow war before, so I wasn't too interested in any of them recognizing me. We packed up our camp as quickly as we could and hit the road. It took moving 1,000 miles away to finally feel comfortable enough to tell you this story. This happened just before my senior year of high school over a period of three weeks in the summer. I was 17 years old, drug-free and sober. At the most, I took Advil for headaches every now and again. I just want to assure you I was not on any mind-altering substances or long-term medication that could affect my cognitive ability. 
During the summer, my curfew was 11 p.m., and this occurred while driving home from my, at that time, boyfriend's house, which took roughly 15 minutes. So let's say about 10, 45 at night. I was full of energy at this age and a night owl, so I was not even remotely tired. In fact, I was hyped up with a warm summer nighttime breeze. Car windows down, singing along to the radio. I took a shortcut through back roads to avoid going into the tiny city with its jerk cops. Also, one of the roads I took was super straight and flat so I could really speed. And that feels great when you're a teenager. But right before that road, I had to take two very close turns to get onto it. First, I'd take a right turn that was more than 90 degrees, almost back the way I had came. Then, in exactly half a mile, I would turn left onto the long, straight road where I could really put the gas pedal down. Since it was only half a mile, I normally didn't speed up that much because the small stretch of road was more like packed gravel than it would be a waste, as I would have to slow down again to turn left onto the much better road where I could let loose. The tiny property on the inside corner of the left turn is where all this went down. A house had recently been built there. Two stories within detached garage, and it seemed odd how quickly it had been erected as we built our family house, and it took us a year to finish it. I will start at the beginning because I believe this is all related. Week one. I am positively jamming to my music. The wind whipping through my car feels great and I'm relaxed in my very familiar drive home. I slow down to make my right turn onto the rough rural road, just be bopping along, when my lights illuminate something stunning sitting on the corner of the road. It's a wolf, a real wolf, a solid white real wolf. I know the difference in my dog breeds and a wolf. I love watching dog competitions, wildlife documentaries, and have even met a one-slash-fourth wolf in person. They looked different from domestic dogs. This was a wolf, and it was amazing and blowing my mind. I slow down even more while I turn down my music. I'm getting close to it, and I, I notice that it's not minding me at all. It is sitting perfectly still on the corner of the road, staring at the house. Almost unblinking, its ears didn't even flick towards me. All its attention was focused on this house. I was so close I could have reached out my window and brushed the fur on the back of its head. I was smiling and amazed, but my mind was already churning. It made no sense for a wolf to be behaving like that, even less for there to be a white wolf in rural North Alabama in the summer. I came to a complete stop behind it, marveling at its fur and presence. I felt euphoric like I had seen something rare and blessed. My mind made a jump to the local Indian stories of animal spirit guardians, and I started to wonder. I couldn't stay, though. Mom would never believe me if I told her I was late because of a spirit wolf. With a sigh, I said goodbye to the wolf and drove home in a better mood than ever. I got to see something special, and it filled me with emotions of joy and peace. Week two. I was driving home again, and I had been taking extra care to keep an eye out for my wolfy buddy, hoping to see him again around that area, so I drove extra slow with my window down and radio off. That was a horrible mistake. I should have realized what the presence of a guardian meant. It meant danger. Alas, I was on the short road approaching the new little house. Then I saw the thing that to this very day makes me question my sanity. My reality and possibility of eldritch terrors, as Lovecraft described. It was crouched right before their mailbox, its limbs folded and pulled in tight with its hunched posture, yet its head was still taller than the box. It was mottled green and black with undertones of blue, and it looked wet and slimy all over. Its head was elongated, allowing for an extended maw full of razor-sharp teeth. The upper half of its body looked emaciated with barely more than frog-like thin skin pulled over angular long bones, ropey muscles to hold it upright, and at the end of its grossly stretched arms were equally terrible long fingers. While its legs had bulk to them and looked equipped for running with back-facing knees for sprinting and tipped in raptor-like curved claws, it looked tall, maybe seven foot, maybe more, 
just folded up into this predator's posture, waiting for prey. Then there were its eyes solid black and sunken. I still want to vomit thinking about its eyes looking at me. Then I realized, it's going to look at me, it's going to see me, and there is no avoiding it. Panic, terror unique to this alien thing swallowed me instantly, feeling like I was tilting off the world I had always known and into an abyss where monsters like this exist. I couldn't breathe, but I had to get my window up. I had to get my window up or I'd be ripped by those teeth and torn with those claws. Blood would adorn the cabin of my car, and I would become an unsolved mystery. I had a manual crank window. F me, I had a crank window because I was scared of crashing into water and not being able to get out of my car. But now I realize that there were far worse things in the world than crashing into water. Its head was turning towards me, and I had let off the gas, but I was still getting closer to it. It made me want to scream, but I had to get my window up first, and I was cranking it as hard as I could. I was starting to cry as I finally got the window closed, and then I put my gas pedal to the floor. Gravel road be damned. I thought I must not look at it as I pass. I must not look at it or make direct eye contact. I just shouldn't. It's not good to connect with these things. I've already seen too much. My tires had found grip, and I started to launch forward, passing it. In my peripheral vision, I could see it starting to unfold its limbs, and it sent a terrible chill down my spine. I'm screwed. I'm really screwed. I'm really screwed. I was mumbling through my tears as I slid around the turn, fishtailing for a moment before I rocketed down the road. I felt sick. My heart was hammering. I had snot and tears rolling down my face, and my hands were shaking. I glanced in my rearview mirror and could only see darkness as there were no street lamps out there. I used a trick I've mentioned in one of my other stories to tap my brake soft enough the light comes on, but I don't actually slow down. Red lit up the dust that was billing up in my wake, but amidst the swirling chaos I thought I saw a darker shadow than the rest. I had enough and decided I was going to drive straight to the lighted roads and not let off the gas again the rest of the way. No more looking back. I was going to drive 100 nanimph, which is as fast as I can go, before my governor kicks in. I even ran a stop sign at the end of the road because I was not going to get caught by this thing if I could help it. I took a right onto the highway and flew home. I might have even been relieved to get pulled over, but I did not. When I got home, no one was awake. I was pretty trusted to come home on time, so I called my boyfriend and cried to him for a long time before I was able to explain. He was dismissive and thought I was pulling a joke on him. Then he thought I was just being crazy and seeing things. There's many reasons we didn't stay together, but his insensitivity contributed. Week three. I refused to take my shortcut anymore. For that reason, I would have to leave my boyfriend's house a bit early, and he'd been making fun of me about it all week. One of the days we went to a park to walk around, and on the way back, he decided he wanted to drive by the house where I saw that thing. I was hysterical begging him not to drive there, but he would not be dissuaded, so as we got closer and I could not stop him, I leaned my passenger side seat all the way back and pulled myself down, cowering in panic of getting near the place. I hid below the window and covered my eyes while panting heavily, reliving the traumatic night in my mind again. At one point he stopped the car. Spooky, you have to see this, he said. Noah whined, resisting him, pulling at my arm. No, you really have to see this look, he said in a changed tone of astonishment. Tears in my eyes, I uncurled and slowly peeked over the rim of the window. The house was gone, burnt clear down to the foundation with only a handful of framing beams still standing. The ground around the house was blackened in a perfect large circle. My boyfriend started to get out of the car. I shouted to get out of here. While I grabbed for his arm, but he easily avoided me and got out. He walked around the ashy piles of the ruins for a bit, using a stick to poke at this and that. When he finally came back, he had an intense look of thinking on his face. There was no evidence of any personal belongings, furniture, power wiring, or even interior walls. It doesn't seem like other burnout houses. Something's weird. When we got to his house, he searched for news articles about any house fires in the area. There weren't any. 
He called the closest fire station and was quickly brushed off by the person that answered as they didn't know about a fire there and didn't have time to find out before quickly hanging up on him. I never wanted to see that place again. I went out of my way to avoid the roads in that area. Talking about it still makes my chest tighten, my skin crawl, and my eyes water. My brain still has trouble because I know I saw it, a thing that is nothing like any creature known to humans, yet still I saw it. If you've heard of something that matches its description, let me know. So when I was in high school, my friends and I were into really spooky shit that we had no business messing around with. We would visit cemeteries at night, go to our small town's local haunt spot, to try to stir up any urban legends. But the story I'm about to tell made us quit cold turkey trying to seek out the paranormal. One night, we were over at our friend's century-old home. I mean, it was old and creaky and the perfect setting for a night of Oija. We brought it out, and for the first half hour, nothing insane happened. Just some movement from the planchette. Then, feeling smug, I asked the spirits what my middle name was. The thing is, my middle name is literally made up by my parents. It's not a real name. No one in the circle knew, let alone could spell my middle name. There was literally no way someone could even guess it. But the board knew. It spelled my middle name perfectly, and I could feel my heart fall into my gut. Keep in mind, my hands were not on the planchette, so I couldn't have moved it myself. Everyone laughed, because what a silly middle name that would be. But I had to confess that it was mine, and the color drained from everyone's face. All of a sudden, a glass ashtray that was sitting a few feet away on the coffee table split clean in two, and we were done. We left the house to go stay somewhere else. I walk outside. It's the kind of dark when it's too early for morning still, but too late for night and it's freakishly quiet outside. I thought nothing of it at the time. Our trash cans were located on the side of the house in the backyard, halfway to the gate. If you stood at the side of my house looking towards the gate, you would see a hedge to the left of the gate that goes up to your waist. Across the street is another house with a driveway light installed. The light gives off that blaring white security light. Anyway, I get to the trash can to throw away the junk. When I look over towards the gate, that's when I saw it, whatever it was. I could only see the outline of it because the blaring white security light was in my eyes but it was the most smooth and round head I've seen, which connected to very slouched shoulders. At first I didn't know what I was looking at, just an odd shape, the same height of the hedges. It wasn't until it moved silently and slowly towards the bottom of the hedge and to the neighbor's yard that I saw it looked headish. I was fourteen at the time and just stood there waiting for more movement or sound. After about one minute, yeah, I waited. Of not hearing anything, I sprint back towards the kitchen door. I don't know what it was or why it moved so silently, but it wasn't much longer before we moved out of that house due to strange things. But that's a story for another time, or at least another post. So to start off, I grew up on a small farm surrounded by forest. It's a small town below a major city in Appalachia. The first incident with this entity was probably when I was maybe 8, 10, so 10, 13 years ago. I was in my bedroom at home listening to music and playing. My window was open and it was evening getting dark, but I could still see outside. I noticed my dad walking by the window stone-faced. I was going to say hello to him, but decided not to. Later, I mentioned to my mom that I saw Dad pass my window. She informs me that my dad wasn't home. In any way, my window was too high up for my dad to have been at that height. Mom decides it was probably a bear. We had a lot of hunting dogs that very often would freak out over nothing, but at the time of seeing what I thought was my dad, they weren't upset. 
I've mentioned this to my significant other before, and my friends and I were talking about our strangest moments, and significant other tells me to tell them that story, but then tells me he saw something similar when we were visiting my dad in his peripherals. He said it looked like a very tall person, but didn't see specific details, but that it walked past the large kitchen window. He meant to tell me earlier, but honestly forgot. It's really weird, and... I'm not sure what else to think about it, but since my significant other told me he saw it too, I've been trying to research what it might be. I've also just felt creeped out at the thought of going to my dad's again. I've had other weird experiences that I'm not sure what to think of, such as going hiking and finding small shacks in the middle of the woods that are my dad's property, then not finding them again and my mother calling me from outside while I was playing and telling me she heard screaming, thinking. It was me and couldn't see me in the yard and thought a wild animal could have grabbed me. Not sure if they're related, but figured I'd add that. In January 2019, I noticed something lumbering down my driveway. The window I was looking out faces over and above the drive, if that's clear. For example, I can see the roof of your car, but not always the bottom of the tire. Regardless, I notice movement. I look out and see what I initially thought was a bear, nose to the ground, kind of snuffling its head side to side, casually walking down the drive on all fours. A little geographical clarity. I live in town. The front of my neighborhood faces a major highway, but the back is all state game lands. I've seen some wildlife, turkeys, a deer here and there, and every skunk in the county apparently lives on my street. I don't see many squirrels, groundhogs, or chipmunks, which is a bit odd. I'm not very far from the city of Scranton. Enjoy, office fans, about seven miles from downtown, so I'm not exactly in the stick. I watch this bear mosey down toward the street, its head lowered. I move from the living room window to my bedroom window that has a full view of the street. Sure enough, here it comes. But something is wrong. I watch this not bear stand on two legs and casually walk out into the road. I see pointed ears and a long snout. It's got its head raised, smelling the air. I felt pee run down my legs. This was no bear. I saw it in perfect silhouette under the yellow street light. It was either dark gray or black. The yellow light threw off the true color. It stood without effort, looked like one fluid movement. It then walked across the road, casual as you please, and kind of hunkered down in some scrub brush. I'm not sure what kind of brush, but it's like forsythia, all tangled and thick. Then I realized it was looking right into my bedroom. It had blue eyes. I'm not sure if that was reflected light if they were glowing. It looked right at me. I lost my legs at that moment and sat down under my window. Absolutely panicked. I was home alone with five cats and a dog who slept through the whole thing. I didn't know what to do. My window is a big picture window. And if it wanted me, it easily could have gotten me. I cautiously got on my knees to peek over the sill and I lost it didn't see eyes or it anywhere. It seemed to be either moving away from the forest behind my house or it decided to rest up in that scrub brush. What I saw under the street light is as follows. Darkish fur, high pointed ears, long muzzle. I never saw teeth or if it had a tail. It had hands with long claws that hung kind of limp wrist. If they were fully extended, they would hang below the knee. It walked digity grade on dog legs. It looked heavily muscled, but had a tapered waist. It was about seven feet tall, judging from where it stood in relation to the streetlight. It was non-aggressive, even when I felt it look right at me. I was terrified, but I didn't get a sense that it was pissed off. It had been seen, as some people report. I didn't take a picture because I simply didn't think to. I was in a fair amount of shock and I'm sure I'll eat crap for this, but sometimes your phone is the absolute last thing on your mind. The next day, I called Vic of Dogman Encounters Radio. His advice was solid, and I try and remember it when I have to go out at night. There have been some odd sounds. Tapping at my window, I can hear scratching of the siding. 
I don't see that many animals around the neighborhood. There used to be about seven stray cats I fed, all gone. Once the weather broke, it's been quiet. I installed motion lights and bought two game cameras. I'm hoping they are in a sense like Sasquatch. They avoid game cams. I don't ever want to see this thing again. Those of you who want to see one pray you never do. My encounter was non-aggressive. I can't imagine having to deal with this thing pissed off. I still can't sleep a full night, and every sound scares the hell out of me after dark. I live alone, and the, and the point three hundred fifty-seven I own would probably just ruffle its fur. Thank you for taking the time to read this. It was a terrifying animal to see. I hope I never see it again, but sadly that wasn't in the cards. I'll post that story another time. As a park ranger, Sarah had heard plenty of stories about Bigfoot sightings in the area. She always dismissed them as nothing more than tall tales, until one night when she had an encounter that she couldn't explain. Sarah was doing her rounds, checking the trails and campsites when she heard a strange noise. It was a low guttural growl that made the hairs on the back of her neck stand up. She shone her flashlight around, but couldn't see anything in the darkness. Suddenly she heard a loud snap and turned to see a massive creature standing before her. It was a bipedal brown Bigfoot towering over her at nearly eight feet tall. Its eyes glowed in the beam of her flashlight, and she could see its powerful muscles rippling beneath its fur. Sarah tried to back away slowly, but the creature took a step forward, blocking her path. She could feel the fear creeping up inside her as the creature bared its teeth, growling menacingly. Just when Sarah thought she was done for, the creature suddenly turned and ran off into the forest. She stood there, trembling and trying to catch her breath, wondering what had just happened. Over the next few days, Sarah couldn't shake the feeling that she was being watched. She heard strange noises and saw shadows moving in the trees. She even found large footprints in the dirt, confirming that what she had seen was real. Finally, she decided to do some research on Bigfoot sightings in the area. To her surprise, she found that there were dozens of reports of sightings, and even encounters like hers. Sarah continued her work as a park ranger, but she always kept her eyes and ears open for any signs of the mysterious creature. She knew that the forest held many secrets, and that she had just scratched the surface of what lay hidden within its depths. I was just an average hiker out for a day hike in the National Park. I had heard the legends of the Wendigo, but I never thought I would come face to face with one. It all happened so fast. One moment I was admiring the beauty of the woods, and the next I was being tackled by a creature unlike any I had ever seen before. It was tall and thin, with matted fur and glowing eyes. It had elongated fingers that ended in sharp claws. Its mouth was wide and gaping, revealing razor-sharp teeth. The creature dragged me deeper into the woods, away from the trail. I struggled and fought, but it was no use. It was too strong. It pinned me to the ground and began to feast on my flesh. I remember thinking that this was it. This was the end. And then everything went black. When I woke up, I was in the ranger station. Park Ranger Harold was sitting next to me. He was the one who had found my body and brought me back to civilization. You're lucky to be alive, he said. I found you just in time, but I'm afraid the creature got away. I felt a surge of fear and anger. How could this have happened? How could a creature like that be roaming free in the National Park? Harold must have sensed my emotions, because he quickly added, Don't worry, we'll take care of it. I've already reported the incident to my supervisor, and he's sending out a team to track and capture the creature. But as it turns out, the supervisor had different plans. He didn't want to call the police because he feared that if the public found out about the creature, the national park would be closed down. So instead, he tasked Harold with finding and killing the creature himself. Harold was reluctant to accept the mission, but he knew he had no choice. He was the only one with experience tracking the creature, and he couldn't let anyone else get hurt. 
So he went into the woods, armed with only a rifle and a determination to take down the monster. It was a cold and dark night when Harold finally caught sight of the creature. He raised his rifle, took aim, and fired. But the creature was fast and agile. It dodged the bullet and tackled Harold. The next morning, another ranger went to investigate and only found Harold's radio dispatcher. They searched for him, but they never found his body. It's been days since Harold went missing, and the creature still roams free. I can't help but think that I was the one who brought this curse upon us all. If I had only stayed on the trail, if I had only ignored the legends, Harold would still be alive. But now it's too late. The creature is out there and it's hungry. I can only hope that the next person who crosses its path is luckier than I was. I was a park ranger at an American national park known for its lush forests and towering mountains. The stillness of the night was only broken by the occasional hoot of an owl and the rustling of leaves and the gentle breeze. And I was on patrol in my jeep, scanning the surroundings for any signs of danger or disturbance. As I drove down a remote road, I suddenly saw a light in the distance. I decided to check it out. As I got closer, I realized that the light was moving almost as if it was alive. I couldn't explain it, but I had a feeling that something was off. I got out of my jeep and approached the source of the light, my hand instinctively reaching for my flashlight. To my shock, what I saw was a ghostly figure, its translucent body glowing eerily in the moonlight. The ghost was dressed in tattered clothes and had a wicked grin on its face. I felt a chill run down my spine as the ghost suddenly burst into a fit of evil laughter. I tried to talk to the ghost to find out what it wanted, but it just disappeared into the woods, leaving me confused and scared. I quickly jumped into my jeep and drove back to the park headquarters, unsure of what had just happened and what the ghost wanted from me. The next morning, I couldn't shake off the feeling of unease from the night before. I told my colleagues about the ghost, but they didn't believe me. They thought I was just imagining things, but I knew what I saw. I decided to investigate further and started to gather information about the history of the park. I found out that the park was built on sacred Native American land, and that there had been several reports of ghost sightings over the years. Days went by and the ghost continued to haunt me. I would see it at night, always laughing and taunting me. I couldn't sleep or eat, and my colleagues were starting to become worried about my mental state. One night, I finally couldn't take it anymore. I grabbed my flashlight and headed back to the spot where I saw the ghost. I called out to it, demanding to know what it wanted from me. Suddenly, the ghost appeared, its form becoming more solid. It told me that the park was built on sacred land and that it was angry that its resting place had been disturbed. The ghost demanded that I help it put the spirits of its ancestors to rest by performing a sacred ceremony. I knew that I had to do what the ghost asked, and I worked with local Native American leaders to perform the ceremony. After the ceremony was complete, the ghost finally disappeared, and I was able to sleep peacefully for the first time in weeks. From that day on, I made sure to respect the land and the spirits that inhabited it, and I never saw the ghost again. But I will never forget that frightening encounter and the lesson it taught me about the importance of respecting the dead and the land they call home. However, my colleagues and I started to notice strange occurrences happening around the park. Trees would shake for no reason, and strange whispers could be heard in the wind. Some of the visitors even reported seeing ghostly apparitions in the woods. We soon realized that the ghost was not the only one who was angry. There were others who had also been disturbed by the park's construction, and they were seeking revenge. One night, I received a distress call from one of the camping sites. When I arrived, I found that several tents had been destroyed, and several people were missing. I searched the surrounding area and eventually stumbled upon a clearing where I saw the ghostly apparition standing together, holding the missing people captive. I realized that I had to do something to stop them, but I was only one person against many angry spirits. I remembered the ceremony that I performed with the Native American leaders and knew that I had to perform it again, this time with the help of my colleagues. We gathered together and performed the ceremony. 
calling upon the spirits of the land to restore balance and peace. To our surprise, the ghostly apparitions disappeared, and the missing people were released unharmed. From that day on, the park was at peace, and the spirits that had once haunted it were finally at rest. I learned that sometimes the things that scare us the most can teach us the greatest lessons, and that the land we live on must be respected and honored. I and my husband were driving down Cabbage Patch, a narrow gravel road near Pine Thicket, looking for deer when husband said, what is that? I looked and said, what the heck is that? I saw a large brown object slightly bent over as if to pick up something. It raised straight upon two legs, had long arms, broad shoulders, and stood about seven to eight foot tall, very hairy. About that time it ran into the Pine Thicket with the speed of lighting. We were about twenty to thirty yards from it. We went back to the site the next morning and we found a small footprint about eight inches long and a big footprint about thirteen inches long in sight of where we seen it. We found some hair on a fence and metal poles that had been stepped on and bent over the fence was pulled up off the post and bottom fence all the way to the ground. We found a persimmon in the area that it was seen, and there was no persimmon tree nowhere around. The sightening was about 1.30 p.m. CST. It was about a one and a half a mile from my house. To give some background, my family owns a trailer home which sits on a cliff overlooking Lake Kootenay in the south of the Canadian province of British Columbia. This trailer was used as a sort of a summer getaway destination, as my parents and I visit for about a week or more each summer. The trailer itself was quite old. It was turned into a home by the previous owners in the 70s, but it's despite its age, it's still a very enjoyable place to experience the warmest months. The trailer sits in the middle of a cedar pine forest with a small clearing on the side facing away from the water to park vehicles as well as a driveway connecting to the road, which is about 110 feet away. The nearest town is roughly a 15-minute drive, and there are no neighbors. I sleep at the opposite end of the trailer, which I call the cabin, as there is an additional dining room and porch built onto the trailer, with a bed at the front end, and mine at the very back. There are two windows next to where I sleep, with one facing parallel to the lake and the other towards the previously mentioned parking area. Due to the positioning of our cabin in a mountain valley around 9 p.m. in the summer, it gets very dark very quickly. Since we sometimes are outside after this time, there's a bright lamp mounted on the front end of the trailer which completely illuminates the porch area, facing the lake and partially lights the parking area creating an orange glow that can get spooky, especially when raining. I hope the backstory wasn't too long, but it might help you get a sense of the surroundings. Around 11 p.m. one night, uh, I was still awake, sitting in bed and reading. I keep blinds of the window facing away from the lake, open as to provide a little light for reading, without having to turn on any inside lamps. The light momentarily gets dimmer, so I glance outside. What I saw was a large, almost glowing white creature, which was moving through the semi-lit area, casting a shadow over my window. It had very long and spindly limbs, and I could see contours that looked like emaciated ribs on its side. It was hard to estimate a height because it was moving bent over in what I can only describe as a crawl. Just looking at it instilled so much fear that I couldn't look away, despite how much I wanted to. The creature moved at a fast walking pace from the front of the cabin and into the tree line. At the time, I wanted to believe that it was some form of very sick, hairless bear, as we frequently saw bears in the area. Looking back, the limbs were just too long to be a bear and too skinny. Also, I would think a bear with mange would still have some hair or discolored skin, but this creature didn't. It appeared entirely to be a white color, and the light from the lamp reflected off its side, making it glow a little. I wish I could provide any form of evidence that what I saw really happened, but ultimately it's the reader's choice whether to believe me or not. 
When I have a moment, I'll draw a diagram to detail its movement in relation from where I was looking from. I was squirrel hunting on public hunting property in northwest Indiana, DNR, about an hour from my house. It is my habit to start my hunting early in the morning. I had never felt any pressure while hunting in this area or since the incident, so I thought nothing of hunting this day. It was fairly quiet except for the twittering of the occasional bird while I'd been there. It was after 11 a.m. when I decided to take a little break and have a snack from my pack so I took a seat along the trail. As I sat there, a voice came into my thoughts that said, Behind you, you preached to listen to your inner voice and trust it. I did. I turned around to look behind me. As soon as I got turned around, I saw an enormous being about nine feet tall and 1,000 pounds, with long, flowing, reddish-brown hair all over his body that resembled an orangutan in color. I only saw it for one or two seconds because that is how long it took for it to stride across the trail opening. I got the impression that it didn't know or didn't care that I was there since it didn't look my way. I was about 120 yards away, just sitting on the side of the trail. I suddenly wanted to get the hell out of there, realizing that I was no longer the apex predator in those woods. The 22 semi-auto rifle I had would have done nothing more than piss off the creature and offered no more protection than a sharp, pointy stick. I head back to my car, looking over my shoulder, the entire time wondering if I was going to end up as a statistic, but I was not going to let this thing destroy my love for the woods. It took me a while, but I did make it back to those same woods. I now say at the very beginning of my hunts that I'm only there to harvest a few squirrels and to enjoy the woods. I'm not there looking for them. I ask that they not scare me while I'm there. So far, that has been working. Does this offer credence to man-speak? I don't know. Did the Sasquatch let me know it was there, wanting me to see it? I don't know, but that is what I am leaning toward. As a young rookie police officer named Johnny, I had seen my fair share of strange things on the job, but nothing could have prepared me for what I was about to face in that national park. When I got the call about a murder there, I didn't expect it to be anything out of the ordinary, but as I arrived at the scene, it became clear that something was amiss. The victim had been torn apart in a way that no human could have done. I started to piece together the clues and realized that the only logical explanation was that the killer was a Bigfoot type of creature. The corpse had unusual marks and paw prints on it, too big to be an ordinary animal. Also, I had heard stories of Bigfoot sightings in the area, but I had never believed in them until now. As I started to investigate further, I began to see signs of the creature's presence all around me. Large footprints in the mud, broken branches and disturbed earth. I knew I had to find the creature, or allow him to find me. Unintentionally, I found a clue on the corpse that led me to a local cave. There was a certain kind of flower on the corpse, only found on a part of park where there is a cave. I didn't tell anyone about my discovery. I decided to venture alone there. So I went there. I made my way inside and found nothing strange. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Suddenly a massive figure loomed out of the darkness. It was a Bigfoot, and it was angry. The creature tackled me, and I tried to fought back as best I could, but it was no use. The Bigfoot was too strong and too fast. As I lay on the ground, I realized that I might not make it out of this cave alive. I tried to run away, but the creature was too fast. It grabbed me by the arm and lifted me off the ground, its hot breath on my face. I closed my eyes and braced for the end, but it didn't come. Fortunately, the Bigfoot heard something behind him. I didn't, but I was sure he had some superior hearing abilities. It was something far away that interested him more than killing me, I guess. He put me down and vanished into the woods. I was shaken and confused. I returned to a park ranger station tried to explain to people there what happened. They mocked me. 
They said that bear attacked a young camper and that they wrote it off as an accident. I tried to persuade them that that wasn't true, but they just said that I smoked some weird crap and that I'll get fired for it. What the F? I grew up an only child in rural Pennsylvania. I used to sneak out of my bedroom and go hang out in our backyard on summer nights when I had trouble sleeping or woke up in the middle of the night. This was around ages 6, 8, mid-90s. I'd go sit just below the top of the backyard hill where I was out of sight of our kitchen window. There were trees to the left with a wild open field across the rest of a mile-wide valley. We had a large hill with a bump in the middle that was perfect for sledding in the winter. Below that was a field with a deer trail cutting through the bottom of the hill and a creek beyond at the center of the valley. On a clear night with a bright moon, you could see across the valley I grew up in about a mile to where my best friend's house had their floodlights on all night behind their house. And when I say rural, I mean very rural Pennsylvania. Parent-teacher conferences were scheduled the first day of hunting season, and kids would often be out for a couple of days just for that. We had two houses in eyeline of our house from that backyard. It was more than 30 miles to our nearest Walmart. I also grew up very familiar with deer, bear, rabbits, and even saw a mountain lion once while hiking with family. All of this to say, I am familiar with wildlife there. The first night I saw Dogman was like any other. I was chilling in the grass, thrilled to just be doing something my parents didn't know about. I saw something moving quickly down along the deer trail. It was dark black against the rest of the night, partway through its path from the woods beside my house. It noticed me and stopped. We just stared at each other for what felt like a long time. It stood up and its ears were long enough to notice from a 100 yard or so distance. It was too thin to be a black bear, which I'd already seen a few times at that age. The staring continued for a long time. Eventually, it put its ears back down, put its front paws on the ground, and sprinted across the valley. I called it my werewolf because of the shape of it standing up. I don't think I ever told anybody. Like now, I, I loved having a secret. But after that first sighting, I went and sat outside a lot more. I remember once on a new moon I sat on the porch because I was too scared to go too far with how dark it was without the moon. I saw it three, four more times after that. It was usually running into the woods by my house, which were more than ten full acres owned just for hunting season. My werewolf never bothered me after that but I remember I was really disappointed when it got cold outside and I'd have to stop going out at night because I wouldn't see it. When I was younger, I used to go to a place called Desolation Wilderness near Camino, California. It was the perfect place for camping and fishing, realizing that it had been a few years since my last trip. I talked to a friend of mine to go camping and fishing. We managed to talk another friend into coming with us, and then we were off. We arrived around 1 p.m. and decided to hike upstream from a place called Wright's Lake, and then, when we found a good spot, we would set up camp. After walking for a couple hours, a ranger found us hiking and told us that we actually weren't even technically in desolation wilderness yet, and that we needed to keep hiking for a bit longer. I started tearing down the camp, but I guess the other two guys were not as enthusiastic about the trip as I was. They left for Placerville to find a hotel room. When they left, I hiked up a bit farther, but I started to worry about the amount of time I had to find a place and set up my camp before dark. As I hiked, I tried to remember the ranger's instructions, but I ended up getting lost. Finally, I found a granite cliff with a stream that had a beautiful pool of water and was right on the tree line. I thought it was perfect, so I set up camp and started fishing. When the sun had set and the sky was dark, I decided to go to sleep. Cozy in my sleeping bag, I started to drift off, but then I heard something growl outside my tent. I grabbed the .45 compact handgun from its case and looked down through the screen on the front of the tent. 
From where I was standing, I could only see a dark figure that looked around four and a half feet tall, standing near the trees. Thinking that it was a bear, I started yelling, hoping that I would scare it away. It didn't move. I then fired a shot at a dead tree nearby. That startled it, and it ran back into the forest. But to my surprise, it didn't go very far. I climbed back into my tent. Then I heard crashing sounds. It was the sound of rocks falling off the cliff and hitting the pool below and the rocks around it. This was unnerving. I climbed out of my tent a few times, but I couldn't see anything even though the moon was bright and the white granite rocks reflected its paleness. Crashing rocks hit every few minutes until around two in the morning. Then it stopped, but I heard something rustling just outside my tent. I yelled at it and tried to scare it off. But instead of scaring it, I heard a very deep growling sound in return. At this point, I didn't want to wait until it got too close. So I got out of my tent and looked around. Nothing. I decided to shoot the tree again to see if the creature would react, then run back into the forest again, just like the first time. But it stopped again. As I listened to the sounds of his moving, I realized that it was running on two feet. This was not a bear. I didn't want to go back into my tent. I grabbed my sleeping bag and moved over to the middle of the big slab of white granite nearby. I felt safer and knew the forest was further away from me, but I could still hear the noises of rocks crashing. I prayed the sun would come up soon. At about 4.30 in the morning, I was awoken from my light sleep. I looked back at the trees but didn't see anything, so I looked back over at my tent. There it was standing at the side of my tent. I panicked and picked up my gun and shot the side of the creature, but it didn't flinch. Then, with giant steps, it walked toward me. I shot at it. I wasn't sure if a point forty-five would even stop such a beast. But it was my only hope. After the second shot rang out, it was off into the trees. Shaking like a leaf, I sat down, clutching my gun. I waited for hours until the light started to appear in the sky. I broke camp and headed back down to Wright's Lake. That was also the last time I saw the creature. That was also the last time I went to the desolation wilderness and I will never go back. I saw the rake or something that I call a rake. I can't tell you what it was. I was driving late at night in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. I live 30 miles south of Alamosa, Colorado. I was driving on a back road with my buddy taking him home near my house. It was about 12 a.m. Out of nowhere, this thing appeared in the headlights in the middle of the road. It was crouching over some roadkill. It was humanoid. It was pale. It looked like it had no ears. It looked like a windigo from until dawn. It looked like it was seven feet tall. Abnormally long arms. No ears. No nose and some nasty teeth. It wasn't skinny, but its skin was tight with ribs visible, and like long claws on the end of its hands. I was barely able to dodge it with my truck as I was driving considerably fast. As I swerved around it, it seemed like time slowed down, and it looked up from the roadkill it was eating and stared at me as I passed. Its eyes were yellow. I immediately braked and yelled at my friend, What the F did you see that? His eyes were wide with fear, and he nods at me. I throw the truck in reverse, but when I approach the roadkill, it was gone. And he claims to have seen it, too. So I know I'm not crazy. When I was a kid, I read a lot of stories about the rake. I know the rake isn't real, so maybe they invented a creature that already existed. Maybe it's a cave creature like in The Descent. If you have any questions, please ask. I've been doing a lot of research. I want to find out what this is. I've been obsessed with him. I need answers. I won't stop looking for him. Hello, old Texas scare. I encountered something strange on my job. I work on an oil rig. My job is to run an excavator and mix off the mud that comes out of the ground and do stuff that needs big machine. Because of the locations of these rigs, I have to drive to pretty remote places in the wilderness of Canada. Anyhow, one of the light towers at the edge of the lease went out. 
I went over, and in the forest I could see these weird-like fireflies type of things, but like the size of a basketball. But they weren't bright, like they weren't lighting things up around them. Then I started feeling super uneasy. Then in between some trees I could see this big-ass silhouette of a person with red glowing eyes. I ran back into the machine just to see it walking away. When I was in it, I ended up telling the crew. I'm not the only one who's seen it. Like half of them have seen it, and two of them have had it smile at them. WTF is, is this thing. Also, I'm so sorry for the punctuation. In 2012, I was driving through southern Utah with a friend completely empty desert land surrounded by mountains, and both of us saw something, or several somethings, actually. They were running alongside the car, but we were faster at 80-ish miles per hour and left them behind. They were incredibly tall. My friend remembers them being tan-colored, but I thought they were more white. Definitely not the color of any animal I know in the area. And by tall, I mean more than twice as tall as the car, or more so eight-plus feet. They were running on all fours right next to the road. Their legs were very thin and tall, and I remember seeing large ears on the top of the head like a bunny, but my friend doesn't remember that. I also think, since they reminded me so much of the rideable creatures in the dark crystal, my brain might have added the ears but those are the closest comparisons I have to what I think we saw. Google dark crystal land striders if you want a comparison. We both saw them and freaked out to the point of us both screaming, and we never knew what we had seen. Is there a known cryptid that looks like this or lives in this area? I'm a ranger at the Grand Canyon National Park, Arizona. It's an incredible job, and you get to meet so many new people. Apart from the obvious scenic advantage, the management there provides amazing service. Our rooms and stations are nice, and they renovate every year before the massive tourist rush. The meals are delicious and fulfilling. Anyway, yeah, I love the job. You might know that the Grand Canyon National Park also shares a boundary with the Navajo region, one of the questions I'm often asked by visitors, especially since I patrol that side of the park, is do you ever have any strange experiences on that side, or if the Navajo people are spooky? According to our training sessions and briefings, the Navajo like to stay to themselves. That's a big reason why I have not really seen them near the park before. Now that I think about it, it was just the other day when I saw an older Navajo man, about 70, he had a hunched back in the typical Native American getup. I approached him, asked if he needed help navigating. He looked lost. As soon as I did, his eyes opened wide and grabbed my hands into it with a really strong grip. It even hurt a little. I don't think the old man had that much strength left in him. He pulled me so I was staring into his eyes at eye level, and he spoke in a very hushed voice. He informed me that he had been looking for me since that morning, but he'd only just found me. When I asked if I knew him, he said that was irrelevant. His next word shook me. He was seeking me out to warn me about my death. I was speechless. I kept asking, who are you? I didn't know what to think about it at that point. I asked him what he meant and told me one of the tribesmen was trying to learn magic and they fell prey to the evils that they could achieve with it. He was apparently said to become a skinwalker. Now, I don't know much about the Navajo people's beliefs or their faith in local stories or any other religions or factions' beliefs, but I didn't believe any of it. They were fairy tales to me, fictional stories. They sounded so absurd, and that's what I thought at the time. The old man was telling me tales, and I figured he was delusional, especially since he was so old. I shrugged off his words and began to walk him towards the gate that would lead him back to the Navajo region. The entire way he kept shaking and repeating as if in a stance that I needed to stay inside my cabin tonight, and I should not come out no matter what happened. I led him to the gate. There was some other Native Americans already waiting for the old man outside. 
To my surprise, as soon as they saw the old man with me, they ran up to us and took the old man away at a speed that really made me think. Anyway, I watched them walk off and disappear off into the distance. I came back inside and got back to my daily duties and checking. The rest of the day was rather uneventful, with the exception of a couple of losing their kid in a park. We immediately helped them, and thankfully we found the child. After sunset, I went inside my unit and took a break. I ate some food and relaxed a little while I was laying on my bed reading a book. I heard this shriek in the distance. It was faint, but I heard it loud and clear. I turned to look at my radio anticipating a voice on the other end saying something about the shriek. There is nothing. I waited for a few more moments. The radio was still quiet. I just shrugged and went back to my reading. I heard the same sound again, this time a lot louder and closer. I was up and gearing up already. I thought maybe nobody else heard it, even though it would be strange. I left my firearm inside. I didn't think I needed it, and I rushed outside in the direction of where I thought I had heard the sound come from. It was a dark night, and it was quiet, which is why the rustling in the distance was so clear. I heard the shriek again, and this time it sounded like an injured animal. It came from behind a tree. I began to approach it slowly, and I stopped dead in my tracks when something emerged from behind the tree. It was something I can't really explain. It was bent down on all fours and growling while looking down. There was drool coming out of its mouth. I took my flashlight from my pocket and flashed over it. That was a big mistake. The thing immediately hissed and stared directly into my eyes. They were pure black, and it scared me. I turned around and ran back. I had nothing to defend myself with. I could hear the thing running behind me. I ran in the direction of the ranger station, went inside, closing the door. I went into the security room and checked the cameras. The one focused on the door outside the station showed that this thing was chewing on something. I couldn't tell. Then it started walking away again on all fours. I stayed in the station until the thing was out of sight. I double-checked all the cameras. I went outside and straight to my room. The next day, I told the other rangers about it in the morning. They checked last night's recordings and were as freaked out about it as I was. We were now extra careful that night and the night after, but we never saw that thing again, and I could not get the old man who had warned me earlier out of my head. There was a secret camping spot in Oregon that I would go to with my friends, often that was extremely hard to find, but absolutely worth the trouble. I decided to meet a friend up there for a weekend in May. When I pulled up 300 hundred yards down the road, there was a man in a VW bus with his dog. He gave me a wave and I waved back. I then met up with my friend near the lake. My friend and I fished for a few hours and were the only people camping on the lake. When it got dark, I went back to my car to put away dinner supplies. To my left was the lake maybe 600 yards away. Straight ahead was a road that lead to where the VW above you bus was, and to my right was thick forest. Right when I shut my car door, I heard a blood-curdling scream, sounded like a woman, about 50 yards to my right in the thick forest. I could not move. I started hearing barking and looked up and saw the man and his dog next to the VW bus. The man had a headlamp on which shined down on the dog who was barking and moving in circles, clearly freaked out by the scream. Then the man started running towards me and yelling, Did you hear that? And still freaked out by the noise, but even more freaked out by the dude, said, Yeah, what was that? The guy stops near me and confidently says, Bigfoot. Here I am, a twenty-something female in the middle of the dense forest. My friend is too far to hear, and some crazy dude is telling me I just heard Bigfoot. He then gets close and says, you know who can protect us. Jesus Christ! Let me put a safety bubble around you. The man proceeds to create an invisible bubble with his arms around the area we're in. I probably awkwardly said, thanks, and all I remember is running back to my friend. When I get back to him, I asked if he had heard the scream, and he said no, and I proceed to tell him the story. Either this was an elaborate prank by Jesus dude, or I heard Bigfoot. 
but the fact that the dog was freaking out still haunts me today. I have many stories, but these stick out for me. Camping in the Alberta foothills in a remote place with my mom. We're just finishing up dinner, probably crap dinner. And it's dusk and we hear a crashing through the woods. The dog starts to go crazy and we watch. Frozen as a moose yearling comes barreling towards and past our sight, trailed closely by a large black bear. Doesn't get more canuck than that. Decades later, I'm female 30. On a solo me, cation with my dog in the West Coenays. 16,000 up a logging road from the nearest pavement and I ditched my car to backpack down and camp on a deserted white sand beach. I see no one all day so I'm swimming and sun tanning and drinking and smoking weed in the nude and just generally being my degenerate granola self. At one point a fisherman trolls by and there are some far off boats but that's the most human interaction I have. I stoke a huge fire and play loud tunes. Bedtime comes and I shut down my sight and tuck the dog in the tent with my axe and hunting knife and we pass out. I wake up hours later to the sound of footsteps in the sand. Not really getting closer, almost as if whoever it is is circling at a distance. It sounded like human feet with back front transfer. All my hair stands up on end, and I immediately regret being the naked, drunk chick lighting a huge signal fire to let any creep within eyesight know where I am. I sat in that tent gripping my axe in one hand and my knife in the other as I waited to be murdered by some backwoods psycho next to my wimp dog. Eventually, the footsteps faded away. I'd like to think it was a bear or a cougar, but my spidey senses still think it was a two-legged danger beast. Left like a bite out to hell the next morning. My college took a bunch of us, youth mentors, on a camping trip without the kids for bonding and leadership skills before the kids camped with us the following week. To preface, this is a college-sponsored event that was drug and alcohol-free, and none of us were drinking or smoking weed. Our camp guide wanted to take us on a night hike without flashlights. The guide at the front was the only one using a flashlight, while the rest of us holding hands had to rely on good communication from the person in front of you. Before the hike, he was burning sage around us for protection and told us we might see unexplainable sights. My best friend and I looked at other like what smoke shack did he come from. As we were hiking, I noticed the moonlight looked very sparkly like little balls of light descending down on one part of the trail. At the time I didn't know what it was, but looking back I think they were orbs. We walked some more, then I felt something following us. I looked up at the top of a tree in a shadow effortlessly hopping tree to tree watching us from below on the trail. I nudged my friend and whispered to look up and she gasped and held my hand tighter. After the hike my friend and I talked about the shadow that followed us and how it kept a safe distance from us. Others said they saw the shadow too and our gad said it was Native American warrior, ghost protecting his area. My family and I went camping in Alaska last year. It was very remote and we were the only people we knew of in this area camping. When we woke up in the morning, my phone was at the entrance of the tent, which immediately creeped me out because I had placed it inside my bag in the tent. I decided that I must have gotten it out during the night and forgot. Later that day, I get into my photos to send some pics of my kids to my pants. As I am clicking on pics to send, I become sick to my stomach. There's a picture of my family sleeping, including me, taken with my phone. I showed my husband and we made the choice to leave instead of stay another night. Camping in Allegheny National Forest back in 99 with this girl I was dating. Two bears stopped about a hundred feet or so away and checked us out. We basically just froze and they continued on their way after a few seconds. 
I think I was rummaging through our food sack where there was jerky and stuff like that. It was the middle of summer, so it's not like food was scarce for them. Plus, there were other people not too far, but still, my heart sure skipped a beat. I was tree planting north of Lake Nipigon for the summer. Halfway through a bag up, I realized I had to shit, get my pants off, lean against a tree, and just as I start shitting, a massive black bear lumbers into the clearing. Looks at me, I look at him. I imagine my obituary mentioning a dad at 19 half covered in my own shit. He lumbers away. If I wasn't already shitting, I would have done it in my pants. Same summer, I'm just south of Lake Nipigon on a different cut block. It's raining hard as F. I have my headphones and listening to Rage, and on top of that, I have my hard hat on, and anyone who's worn a hard hat in the rain knows that it's loud as hell. Anyway, I'm about 50 feet out from the tree line when a song ends, and I feel this present. Slowly turn around. Big F, off bull moose, bursts out of the tree line and is booking it at me. Screamed like a girl and literally dove behind this big-ass rock ten feet to my right. This asshole charges right through where I was standing impossibly fast because they're basically goofy all-terrain horses. Looks slightly over his shoulder at me as if to call me a loud bitch, then keeps galloping off into the far tree line. Taught me a lesson. Never blast music in the woods so loud that you can't hear your surroundings, even if you're doing a shitty job that you can barely stand. Finally, next summer, I'm planting near the border with Manitoba. Windy day. Just finished a bag up. Crossing back through my land when a random huge gust of wind slams this cluster of dead trees. We call them chickles, and slams three of them over. The sounds of the roots ripping through the ground was insane. One of them was big enough to easily kill me and crush me so bad I'd be unrecognizable, which it would have done if its roots had given way faster, and I didn't have an extra second to realize it, what direction it was falling and dodge left. Missed me by ten feet or so, had a forearm. Thick branch slammed my knee and knocked me out of commission for the day. Point is, tree planting in northern Ontario is basically final destination. Maybe just for me, though. I went camping in Ontario at a campground in May. It was still pretty cold, so it was super empty. During the night, myself and a friend were sitting by the fire when we heard noises in the bushes over the course of a few hours. Couldn't tell what it was. Then, once we got in the tent, a pack of coyotes surrounded us, and we're sniffing around at our feet through the tent. They were yipping and growling and whining outside our tent. Some laid against the tent just waiting for some movement. It was horrifying. There was definitely at least ten. I called 911 because I didn't know what to do. They sent a cop car to our site, which scared them all away. The cop asked where I was from. I'm from a very rugged area with a lot of wildlife that aren't used to humans and avoid humans, and he laughed at me for being a wuss. Don't feed wildlife. I was at Walmart earlier, and there was a lady in the parking lot feeding a fox peanut. Like WTF? On a scout trip to Halliburton, Ontario, we had made a day hike out to a remote lake for the night. At the time, I was working on wrapping up my wilderness survival badge. One of the requirements was building and sleeping in a shelter, and I was so excited to avoid carrying more gear. We climbed a rock outcropping overlooking Mislaid Lake, and I began looking for a good spot to begin setting up. I discovered a partially uprooted tree that created a shallow burrow. The roots picked up all of the moss and dirt like a carpet, requiring minimal updates to make this hole a home for a night. After cleaning out the spider hotel, I shimmied myself deep under the roots in my bag for the night. I awake in the middle of the night in fear. I know something woke me up, but I'm not sure what. Laying perfectly still, my eyes wide open as my heart catches up and starts pounding. Then I hear it, something breathing. It's walking nearby and it sounds big. 
my mind starts screaming bear as I start sliding deeper into the burrow. My friends in a tent nearby whisper to me, Hey, you hear that? Can you run over here? Quietly, I respond, No way. I have my knife trained on the entrance. My focus is locked in the small opening, contrasted by the bright moonlight as I wait for a snout to appear to launch my defensive. I hear the meandering steps getting closer when the animal abruptly pauses and then explodes with a huge snort. The amount of air this moose snorts out nearly blew out my eardrums. It sounded like an air hose breaking. In an instant, this moose blows and turns to run out of our camp, crashing through trees and brush along the way. At the moment, I was so relieved it wasn't a bear, but the next morning revealed just how close I came to disaster. Hoof prints a few strides from my flimsy moss roof. A few more steps, and I would have been crushed. Kinda dislike telling my story because it almost doesn't sound real low. Got a rooftop tent for my Jeep for my girlfriend recently. We drive out to her family's property and stay like a hundred yards into the woods behind her grandmother's house on a trail that's been cut. We're like an hour from the nearest town, middle of nowhere. Around 3 a.m. I wake up due to the Jeep shaking. Wasn't much but enough to wake me. At first I thought it was my girlfriend moving around, but the jeep shakes again, and I could tell she hadn't moved at all. Jeep shakes a couple more times, then I hear the metal panel of either my front passenger door or front quarter panel warping in. I wake my girlfriend up. She confirms something outside, shaking the jeep. At this point I was praying for anything besides a person because I didn't have my glasses or gun with me, and it was a new moon phase, so it was completely dark out. We never looked outside to see what it was. Never figured it out. Never heard nails or anything touch the Jeep, and never heard footsteps at any point. I set the car alarm off to try and run off whatever it was. I didn't sleep the rest of the night. Another story I have is staying in central Mississippi. Literally every 20 minutes, multiple packs of coyotes would howl for minutes in every direction. At times, it was so loud, I thought they were circling the jeep, or within 50 feet from us, but we never actually saw them. This was a really cool trip, because although I've heard coyotes before, it was never so many, so loud, or so frequently nearby. We didn't sleep all night because we simply couldn't with the noise, Two years ago, I was camping with my ten-year-old and her friend. We were screwing around, dancing, and I stood up too fast, got lightheaded, and fell face first into the fire. My forehead hit the fire ring, and I plunged my arms into the coals. I launched myself out of the fire immediately, but my shirt was on fire, and my head was a bloody disaster. As soon as I saw the amount of blood on the towel I put to my head, I thought F. It was 10.30 p.m. I had the girls dump all our water on the fire, grabbed my phone and keys and quickly hiked us out to the car. I left everything else behind, including my glasses and wallet. The girls were crying. Started driving towards home and called 911 to ask where I should even go. Turns out that the closest the ER was actually where we lived, 45 minutes away. So I drove home in the dark through a bunch of construction without my glasses in shock and bleeding profusely. I made phone calls on the way to have my husband and the other child's mom meet us at the hospital. It wasn't until the ER nurses started wrapping me up in sarin wrap that I realized that I had a bunch of burns, including second degree burns on my arms and hands. That shit was crazy, and I have the gnarly scars to prove it. Back when I lived in the United Arab Emirates, my co-workers and I off-roaded into the sand dunes in the empty quarter, an extremely remote part of the Arabian desert, to camp. We had no tents since it was the desert, and it never rained. About an hour after going to bed, I woke up to the sound of thunder and opened my eyes to see lightning strike a couple of feet from our sleeping bags, and it just kept coming. We all screamed, bloody murder! grabbed our gear and sprinted as fast as we could across the dunes to our car.
It probably looked hilarious since we were stumbling all over the place, but we were genuinely scared for our lives. We then had to off-road back to the highway on wet sand through what was by far the most intense lightning storm I've ever seen. We sped the four hours home to Abu Dhabi without stopping, and I have never been happier to sleep in my own bed. So much for it never raining in the desert. Some of our other friends had a differently scary experience camping in the same area a few months earlier, as they were sitting by the fire drinking beers. They were approached by a group of armed Saudi border guards and told to pack up camp. Apparently, they had unknowingly crossed the Saudi slash Emirates border, since it's not marked in such a remote R of the desert, and were camping on the Saudi side, beers and all. The border police let them move their camp about 30 feet back to the Emirates side, and all was good. It just about gave them a heart attack, though. Camping at Lake Gunnersville in Alabama. That area is prone to sudden pop-up thunderstorms. So I had a giant 20 feet by 40 feet tarp fly set up high up so the fire ring firewood storage and cooking area had a roof to keep everything dry and give us a sheltered seating area. It was about 4 p.m. Had the fire going and was about to start cooking dinner. A giant dark wall cloud rolled over the mountain ridge behind us. Shortly after we saw the cloud come over the ridge, there was a giant downburst that smashed the tent flat, snapped the center rope for the fly, and brought the whole campsite down. I was afraid the fly tarp was going to catch fire. It turned out that sudden blast of freezing cold wind was so intense that it blew the campfire out like a candle. We found the dog hiding under the truck. The whole thing was over within 45 seconds, but it took the rest of the day to repair the damage to the campsite. We ended up having MREs for dinner. During this last hunting season, I was hiking into an area well before first light. It's a wilderness area, and I was trying to get ahead of the five, yes, five, different groups of hunters at the trailhead. It leads into a very large area. Anyways, I was two and a half miles in, and it's a full moon, but I'm in the shadow of a ridge in a wooded area. So aside for the little I get from a red headlamp, I can't see more than a few feet in front of me. I came across an 18 feet blue igloo cooler that had quite obviously been torn up by an animal and checking up on it I gathered from the tooth and claw marks it was a bear. Now mind you there's no camp in sight but I know that around 8 miles in there's a group that uses pack animals to get better. Set up I assume they lost it and just didn't realize. Now I have no idea of when the cooler could have been torn up or when any of it happened. I just keep moving along. I don't have bear spray or anything. For those who know, I have a 9mm with FMJs and a .240, three so am not exactly equipped for a big bear. About 60 yards down the trail from where I found the cooler, I heard it. Never did see it. The creek was about 40 yards from the trail I was on and it sounded like boulders being rolled over in the creek. The stupid thing I did, I think, was not make more noise than I should have. I was only about a half mile from the specific draw I wanted to hunt, and I didn't want to ruin my chances since the area had already been hunted really hard. So not only did I hear the bear figure out I was there, I heard him decide not to leave. Headlamp on full blast, pistol in hand, fastest 2.5 miles of my life. A few years ago, I was camping in Smoky Mountain National Park near Cherokee, North Carolina. The first night, the people in the next campsite over began crying and shouting at a large man who was slumped over the picnic table, and I ran up to assist. Not sure exactly what was wrong, but we got him up and stable. But he kept passing out. He was very large. We were somewhat remote, but there was a camp host way down the mountain. I blew the horn on my truck three long times, and the host responded. We got him to the hospital in Cherokee, and I joined the family. 
The doctors got him stable, said it was something with his heart, and then said we had to take the patient somewhere else because he's not Cherokee. Learned a lot about tribal law that night. One night I was backpacking with a friend. We hit the trail kind of late, maybe around four or five, and planned to go eight miles to water. Had been there the year before. It was the middle of summer, so we had plenty of light. We got the eight miles out, and where they were supposed to be water, there was none. But I knew where rivers were around there, back the way we came and down another trail, so I wasn't too nervous. Water is so vital, especially in the southwest, and can cause panic when it's not where you think on a backpacking trip. But it was pitch dark by that point, and we still had to hike. Another couple of miles to try to find somewhere to sleep, because there really wasn't any good flat ground to pitch a tent around the dried up spring, and we had originally planned to go a bit further down the trail, but we now needed to focus on heading towards the water. The river was about six miles away, so we end up camping very remotely in this weird splotch of flat land, with like little stones in the grass that we literally see the moonlight reflecting into, and I think that's the only way we would have known it was in there with such dense forest. It's a kind of thing that would just been impossible to see in the daylight, so we set up camp, eat a little food, take a few drinks of water, and then go to sleep. The wildest night of my life. I'm in my tent, and it seems to get windy, and there are things scratching on the outside of my tent, and I know I set up my tent with nothing around to scratch it, so I get it out a couple times to see if there's a little bush or something, but there's not. The bushes are not touching my tent, so I start to fall asleep just trying to meditate and get past the wind. My friend is over in her tent, COVID, so we were being safe. I start to fall asleep, and I hear my friend behind me, and I scream because she startled me, and I turn over, assuming she got spooked and came in to sleep with me, but nobody has climbed into my tent. I swear there was somebody hovering over me just a minute before. I want to be clear here that I'm not afraid of the forest. I live a couple miles from here, and I'm very comfortable in this setting. I've spent my entire life in wild spaces. Love to backpack and have never been spooked by anything other than an animal too close. And they have always been outside my tent, never in. So after I get spooked awake, I'm obviously a little on edge, and my friend called over from her tent and was asking if I was okay. I screamed, and she had never heard me do that before. I'm like, yeah, man, things are just word over here, and she's like, yeah, over here. I guess it's this wind, and we go back to trying to sleep. What ensues is me laying there all night with wind that looks like hands pushing on the tent. I'm sitting up in my tent trying to rationalize how the wind could push on one space and not another and come from multiple directions like pushing many sides of my tent at once. Because what it seems like is there's people or beings outside shaking and pushing on my tent. Let me reiterate that I have spent hundreds of nights in tents, and I have never seen anything like this. I leave my tent several times, and the wind seems to die down. It's not that windy out there. There's definitely no people out here. This goes on for hours until I finally zone out right before sunrise, and I'm grateful to be able to get up and pack up and leave. That field highlighted by moonlight, I, I don't think, has had people in it in a very long time and I'm not sure what was going on there, I wouldn't spend the night there again. As we were hiking to water, I expressed to my friend that I didn't get any sleep because of the wild night with the wind, and she was freaked because she had the same experience and said she was so scared, and she thought she was making a big deal out of the wind, but that she has never experienced wind. Like that, that seemed to defy nature's laws. Another person who has spent hundreds of nights in tents, Several summers in a row, she did multiple weeks on long trails. Very experienced. It was intense. I was at work one day in the late fall. It was 1995 at a national park in the state of Washington. The name will be redacted for the story. It was late morning around 11. The weather was overcast around 50 or 60 degrees. There wasn't much wind. 
Work was slow that day, and I was alone in the tower monitoring the parking lots of the trailhead. It would be nice to have some distractions, so I decided to radio down to the other rangers at the visitor center, ask them if they wanted to come up to the tower with me. Most just said they would be as soon as they were available. At this point, I decided to just continue my slow patrols of the parking lots, hoping I would run into somebody I could talk to. I went to the northmost parking lot and began walking slowly down the road that ran behind the lot. As I walked, I looked around for cars that looked like they had been parked for a while and trash in the parking lot. As I reached the end, I noticed something on the other side of the road. It was standing just left to the road, maybe fifty yards away. I stopped and looked at it, thinking it might be a person that was just getting out of the car, but it didn't move. So I assumed it was a person until I got a better look. I started walking towards it, thinking it may have just been somebody. As I got closer, it just stood there, frozen, and then was facing me. It kept its head moving back and forth like it was looking around, and I realized this was not a person at all. It was at least eight feet tall, covered in brown fur that was very long, kind of like that of a sheep or a bear. But the head was white with a pointy snout big round eyes that did not seem to have any visible eyelids. Its arms were like human, but they seemed very long and had a lot of muscle and definition to them. Even with all the fur, it was standing on two legs like an upright person would, but kind of leaning forward on its hands almost. It had a flatter face, at least beside the snout. I noticed I didn't have any teeth, at least that I saw. I'm not sure what I was looking at, it was very strange, but the most strange thing was its lower body. It kind of resembled more like that of a kangaroo because of how its legs were bent backwards towards its butt. I kept thinking to myself, I'm either going crazy or somebody is in a very elaborate costume. The more I kept staring at it, I realized that it must be somebody playing a joke, but it looked far too realistic. I was scared at this point, and I just stood there looking at it and trying to figure out what it was and what to do. It then looked back at me exactly, and I heard a voice. It was one of the other rangers that I had called earlier. He was asking me what I was doing, and I told him I had found something out in the far parking lot and wanted him to come take a look. It was then that I heard its voice. It was almost telepathically. It was kind of like a growling sound, but more like a series of sounds that sounded more like a language than just a growl. I don't know how to explain it, but it was the most terrifying thing I've ever heard. I turned around and started walking as fast as I could back to the tower. I was halfway there when I looked back and saw this thing was following me. I made it to the tower and got up as fast as I could. It was still standing now in the parking lot. Now I thought I might try and climb over the fence, but it did not. I looked back several times and never crossed the road. One of the other rangers came up about a half hour later. I told him what I saw. I'd asked him to go out there with me, but he refused. I called the other rangers from other parks. They wouldn't come out either, even though they laughed at me. I still think part of them believed me. I never saw it again after this, but I don't think I could ever face it again. I haven't told my wife about it. She thought I was crazy and does not believe me. I'm not crazy. I do not know what that thing was, but I know I saw it. From that day on, the incident haunted me. I couldn't shake the image of that creature from my mind. I often found myself staring into the woods, wondering if it was still out there, waiting for me. I tried to tell my superiors and colleagues, but they refused to believe me. I was labeled as a delusional old ranger who had spent too much time alone in the wilderness. I was forced to retire soon after, and I've been living in isolation ever since. I know what I saw that day was real, and I know that it's still out there. I've heard stories from other people who have encountered similar creatures in the woods, and it's clear that it's not just a figment of my imagination. I can only hope that it never crosses paths with any unsuspecting hiker or camper. But who knows, maybe it already has. I lived in a haunted house. I was never afraid of supernatural, but it was a strange year living there. 
When we visited the house the first time, I felt this strange, unsettling feeling. I didn't want to live there, but I was 16 at the time, and I had no vote in the house my mom would choose, and it ended up being this one. Thankfully, it was a rental, so we could leave any time. There was an old blue trailer in the yard. The homeowner told us we could make any change to the house, but we could not touch the trailer ever. We never even went near it. It was old and filthy, and we didn't care for it. During the time that we lived there, a series of stuff happened that we couldn't really explain at the time, but like I said, I was never really afraid of supernatural. We would clean, and suddenly the floor would be covered in muddy dog feet. No dogs around. One night I want to change a lamp standing on a ladder. The ladder tips over. I nearly hit my head on a sink. It was really close, but no reason for the ladder to tip over. In one year, our house gets hit by lighting three times, going front to back, breaking every single thing that was plugged into electricity. One of these times, my brother was outside in the back, taking in some stuff he left outside, so it wouldn't get wet from the rain. Lighting hits, and he gets ejected at least three meters through the air across the lawn, hit a fence, and falls on the ground. Miraculously, he shook but unharmed. One night, I wake up having to use the bathroom. I get up and hear water running, so I walk into the bathroom. Nothing. I wake my mom, tell her I hear water. She does, too. We go downstairs. It's flooded, ankle high already. A pipe burst. Mind you, those pipes were replaced when we moved in as part of the agreement, so they were new. Another day, I come home. We got a kitten. I find its head in the living room. Blood and nothing else. Looked like something ate it. It was horrible. For the longest time, there was this girl who would walk in and out the house. We usually only caught a glimpse of her, mostly heard her giggle. This was a friendly neighborhood, so we figured it was one of the neighbor's kids who was curious and playing games. We let her be. For a long time after that, nothing out of the ordinary happened. But we wanted out of the house. We found a new place, and while we were moving, one of the neighbors comes to ask if we need help. He glances at the old trailer and says so, that thing is still here, huh? I told him we weren't allowed to touch it, asked him if he knew why. Since he was so interested in it, I thought he might know. He told me the people who originally bought the ground to build the house lived in that trailer until the house was ready. They never finished it because the dad shot his sixy daughter and wife and then committed self-harm. Because of some formalities, the case was never closed and the trailer was a crime scene, which made it illegal to take away or enter it, he continued. After those people died, the house was bought by a dog breeder. He finished the house, and one night he wanted to change a lamp and his ladder tips over, hit his head on the sink, and he died. To this day, I am certain those two families and even the dogs were present in that house. I am a cop in Alaska. I worked nights and was in the outskirts of town. Myself and two other officers responded to a family's house where they heard someone howling like a wolf under their back deck. When I was on my way, another officer called me and said that he had been to the neighbor's house earlier. The department had had a few problems with the neighbor where he had called several times saying someone was breaking into his house, but there was no one there and there was no sign of anyone being there. No tracks in fresh snow. That night the neighbor thought that someone was breaking into his house. He called the cops and went outside to confront the person. When he went outside, he didn't find anyone, and though he saw someone in his window, so he shot at his own house. When the police got there, there was no evidence of someone going into the house. The general consensus was that the neighbor was crazy. So while we were going to the call, we think the crazy neighbor has gone under the deck and was howling. When we got there, we spoke to the homeowner, and they asked us to walk around the house. We didn't find any footprints. The other officers looked into the woods a little bit, and I spoke to the homeowner. They said that they swore they heard howling under their deck. The wife said that a week earlier she saw the police go to the neighbor's house, and when the police walked around the house, a skinny man with a dark jacket and long, dark hair ran around from the other side of the house and ran into the woods. 
We looked further into the woods and found tracks that lead to another person's house, then further into the woods where we lost the trail. We told them to lock their doors and to call us next time they heard or saw anything. Maybe the neighbor wasn't crazy. I couldn't believe my eyes as I stared at the lifeless body of my sergeant. He had taken his own life in the police station and left behind a note with coordinates. I knew I had to investigate. The coordinates led to a remote part of Yellowstone National Park. I knew it was a long shot, but something compelled me to follow through. I set out on the long drive to the park, unsure of what I would find. When I arrived, I met a park ranger who told me that the area I was headed to was off-limits to visitors. I knew I had to be careful, so I lied and told him I was just there to do some hiking. He reluctantly let me pass, but warned me to stay on the designated trails. As I hiked deeper into the woods, the smell of rotting flesh grew stronger. I knew I was getting close to something, but I had no idea what it could be. Suddenly I saw a cave in the distance. My heart raced as I approached it, unsure of what I would find inside. As I neared the entrance, a terrifying creature emerged. It had the body of a man, but the head of a dog. It let out a roar that sent shivers down my spine. I reached for my gun, but my hands were shaking so badly that I missed my target. The creature charged at me, tackling me to the ground. I struggled to get free, but it was too strong. I was certain that I was going to die. Just as I thought it was over, the creature let out a final roar and ran off into the woods. I lay there for what felt like an eternity, trying to catch my breath. When I finally stood up, I knew I had to get out of there. I stumbled back to the park ranger, my mind racing with what had just happened. You're insane, the park ranger said when I told him about the creature. There's no such thing as dogmen, but I knew what I had seen. And from that day on, I couldn't shake the feeling that something sinister was lurking in the woods, waiting for its next victim. I never forgot about that encounter, and I never went back to that part of the forest again. I knew that some things were better left alone. I was a cop for about five years, and worked for a boss that used to tell this story all the time. Just a warning, this story contains self-harm, so don't read if that will trigger you. When he was a rookie and got his first car, they mostly walked back then. He patrolled his district and decided to check out this cemetery area. Kids often went back there as it was near a skate park to do extracurricular activities. As he drove up, he saw a person who had hung himself from a tree. He immediately called it in, and the scene was properly investigated. Well, the weird part is, the next night he became curious, so he went back to the same area. The tree was gone. The city had not put in any work orders to cut the tree. The city I worked for did not do that type of thing, as it cost money and the city was too cheap. There was also no stump in the ground. There was no place the tree could have gone. He was in that spot for about six or so hours during the investigation, so he was familiar with it. It spooked him at the time. I used to be a park ranger at the Grand Canyon for 20 years. I've seen some pretty strange things in my time out in the wilderness, but nothing compares to the horror I encountered deep in the woods one summer. I was called to investigate the case of a young girl who went missing while on a hike. Her family and friends searched for days, but they couldn't find a trace of her. As a seasoned ranger, I decided to take a look for myself. I ventured deep into the woods, following the trail of the missing girl. After several hours of searching, I stumbled upon a gruesome sight. The body of the young girl lay in front of me, torn apart and bloody. I couldn't believe my eyes. The girl's body was mauled by something, and from the looks of it, it was something inhuman. I knew that I had to investigate this. I followed the trail of footprints and blood, trying to find the monster that killed the girl. The trail led me deeper into the woods until I reached a clearing. And there I saw it. The creature was unlike anything I had ever seen before. It stood on two legs like a man, but it had the head of a goat. It was covered in fur 
and it had razor-sharp claws and fangs. The creature's eyes locked onto mine, and it grinned. It let out a screech that chilled me to the bone. I was paralyzed with fear. I couldn't move or speak. The creature continued to grin at me as if it knew something I didn't. It then turned around and fled into the woods. I couldn't believe what I had just seen. A part of me wanted to believe that I was hallucinating, but deep down I knew that the creature was real. I reported the incident to my superiors, but they didn't believe me. They thought I had lost my mind out in the wilderness, but I knew the truth. The creature, the goatman, was still out there lurking in the woods. It was waiting for its next victim. I shared my tale with my friends around the campfire. I saw a fear in their eyes. The forest that was once a place of joy now turned out to be a terrifying place. The goatman, it's still out there, and it's not done killing. I wanted to warn them to be careful, to not go too deep into the woods. But what's the use? Some creatures can't be stopped. All we can do is pray that they don't cross our path. So these two veteran cops, let's call them Bob and Mike, respond to a 911 that lack details on a nicer block in the shit neighborhood of a large city. They get to the house and are met by this older woman who was clearly an immigrant from one of the Caribbean islands, judging by her accent. She welcomes them in and politely tells them that she didn't make the call and alluded to having had previous issues with some of the local punk kids, so they probably made the call as a prank. So Bob is not green by any standard and is pretty well educated for a cop. Super rational guy who has faced absolute nightmares with unflappable stoicism. But damned if there isn't something about that house that's telling him to run and not look back. And there's no reason for it. The house isn't a mansion, but it's clean and well kept. The woman is annoyed about the prank call, but entirely cordial with him. There's no weird sounds or smells that suggest something is amiss. Still, he can't shake this feeling of unbridled terror. They eventually finish taking the report and leave. After they get into the car, Mike looks at Bob and says, Damned, I'm so glad to be out of there. Place freaked me that out on it. Now this worries Bob more because Mike, in addition to being a veteran cop with time in the homicide department, was also some veteran of an elite military unit. His name entirely escapes me at the moment, and all around Badass, that they both were independently freaked out was bizarre. Still, it's a big city, and they have other stuff to worry about, so they get back to work. But leaving that feeling unaddressed didn't sit well with Bob. When he was on his own and had nothing pending, he went back to that neighborhood and found the block captain, pro tip. If you want to know the details in a specific area, find the block captain. So he asked her, hey, you know that islander lady on your block? The captain says, oh, you mean the witch. And Bob is just like what? Remember those kids that were giving the homeowner a hard time? Apparently, one of the local punks threw a rock at her window not too long ago, before Bob and Mike visited. This shit, let's call him punk, basically acted like an asshole prick when the woman confronted him. Witnesses say she swore he would regret it. That very night, punk's parents rush him to the local hospital, which is actually a really phenomenal hospital despite the neighborhood. He's in massive pain for apparently no reason. The ER runs tests. He's in multiple organ failure, and they have no idea why. None of their tests showed any reason why a previously healthy teenager was just dying in front of them. Nothing poisonous, no injuries, etc. The staff valiantly worked to stabilize him, but nothing was working. At last, the parents went to the homeowner's place, throw themselves in front of her door, and beg her to spare their son. The homeowner supposedly looked at them with an oddly neutral face and said their son would be fine. Sure enough, for no reason that the hospital staff could fathom, Punk does a complete 180 during the night. All his organs start working again. He stabilizes and is back to 100% come morning. There isn't even any permanent damage to his previously imperiled organ. Bob later confirmed at least Punk's mysterious illness and equally astounding recovery. 
Bob's contact was totally creeped out when he told her about the homeowner. Edit, I'm seeing lots of critique on my writing. I wrote the post while having trouble sleeping, so I'm aware it's not exactly Shakespeare. However, I didn't make any of it up, and I trust the guy I heard it from. There's probably a sensible explanation that no one has figured out, but I'm confident that this happened. And even if you don't, it seems a little uncalled for to be a jerk to others commenting. This story came up when I asked Bob about the prevalence of people who believe in magic in urban neighborhoods after reading about it being a thing in Chicago. I was probably just 18. I had lived in the city my whole life, but had recently moved to the desert. I'm talking double-wide trailer, maybe five other people living within a mile or so around us, 140 acres of just nothing but sand and cactus. I was already freaked out because I was so used to the sounds of a big city, cars at all hours of the night, sirens. It was never quiet, and goddamn was it dark. Well, I was laying in the bed of a truck right outside the trailer on the phone with my girlfriend at the time, laying on my back looking straight up into the sky. It was lit up like a Christmas tree. My entire vision was just stars. It was fascinating. Well, while I'm on the phone at the very right of my vision, I see something moving. I thought it was a shooting star. Nope, bright-ass light moving around fast and not in a straight line. This thing was moving in random directions, like if you took the mouse on your computer and just moved it all over the screen. So I stopped talking on the phone. It got extremely quiet, like white noise quiet, while I'm staring at this light moving all around. Then as it gets to about center of my vision, it just stops. My heart started pounding. Then it broke into two separate lights, and they started to do the same weird random movements. No pattern at all. Then again, they stop, and I was waiting to see if they would split again. Nope. Boom, like rockets, they zip out into different directions until they were out of my vision. I was completely frozen. I didn't even remember being on the phone anymore. I felt like a child axing that was too afraid to go into a dark room. Frozen. Eventually, I snapped to and bolted into the house. I remember telling my family about it, and they completely dismissed it. I didn't go outside past the fence alone for a while. I worked graveyard shifts as an unarmed security guard. That's officer ran a cop to you, smartass. I've had the same post since starting with the company, now going on a year. It's in a fairly busy metropolitan area, but it's really quiet at night. There's a police station practically across the street, so I'm mostly just there to satisfy the insurance company or on the off chance someone's brazen enough to try to steal building materials. The main area of the project is an office building. There's a multi-level parking structure that's attached, also mid-construction. The rear of the property is bordered by a tall concrete wall, after which there's a busy highway running in parallel. One night, maybe a week or two after Thanksgiving, I was sitting in my car, deep into an especially long and depraved session of plague ants, during which I repeatedly killed off all of Earth's inhabitants through very torturous and sadistic means. A thin layer of snow had already accumulated on my windshield since my last patrol. I couldn't really see out of it, per se, but I had civilizations to neutralize. Being a good security guard is all about knowing your priorities. That all changed when something violently rattled my car. While I don't have a gun, I do keep nunchuku on me at all times. Blue belt and kung fu, thank you much. So I grabbed those and my Nebo O2 beam flashlight and jumped out of the car. I couldn't imagine what was responsible for the disturbance, but I assumed my field supervisor had something to do with it. He didn't have much of a sense of humor, but he made it a point to try and sneak up on unaware guards. He wasn't very good at it. It's weird, though I exit my car and there's no one in sight. There's a thin layer of snow on the ground, so footprints or tire tracks would have been an obvious giveaway. I was about to write it off as a weird environmental effect, 
But then it happened again. It didn't feel like a shaking thing when I was on my feet, though more like a high amplitude current in the ground. Now I'm on high alert, so I switch to the emergency scanner app on my phone to see if they're getting any calls about an earthquake or explosion or something. There's no communication at all for a good five minutes. Then some run-of-the-mill chatter about a drunk driver on the other side of town. I'm a little spooked now, but rather than get back in the car, I decided to do my next patrol a little early. I knew there was nothing to worry about, but figured it would put my mind at ease to check the site for myself. Just in case, I started by looking around the parking structure. There was only one accessible entrance which my car was parked in front of, but squatters are a thing, and it was a cold night. Nothing. I still had one earbud in on the off chance that people started calling in. There's a domestic disturbance call, then silence. Then the rumbling comes back. The whole structure feels like it's wobbling. I just checked the last corner and decided to get the F out in case something decided to collapse. Just as I leave the garage, something in my periphery catches my attention. On top of the building there are a couple security lights, but one is completely obscured by a lift and construction materials. So when I tell you I saw the silhouette of a man on top of the building, understand that it's really just a silhouette. My paranoia is pretty peaked out at this point, which I factored into my assessment of the situation while taking no comfort from it whatsoever. I decided to grab my binoculars out of the car, which I felt confident would reveal the silhouette to be nothing more than heightened pareidolia and a stack of tooks fours. When I got back to the car, I just about lost my shit. There was an impression in the snow, like someone had laid across my hood. Two handprints were melted into the windshield. No footprints or tire tracks except for the ones I knew without question I had made. I pulled out my smartphone, not really sure what I hoped to do with it, but you understand the impulse it was off, battery dead. Before I got out of the car, the phone had been plugged in and was charging, over 90% battery. I felt the rumble again, promptly got in the car after checking the back seat, obviously, and drove it to the other end of the site. If there were squatters there, I concede to victory. Either way, I never got any complaints from the foreman or my, my supervisors. I asked one of the other guards if he'd seen anything weird while working the post, and he just shrugged. I still have no idea what happened that night. So the guy that lives across from my parents, and who is basically a second father to me, is a fire investigator, and over the years I will go work fire scenes with him if he needs help. We've seen some pretty wild shit, which are some pretty fantastic stories for another time, but this one takes the cake. So we are on our way down to the scene, which was in Miami, and I was going over the reports to get a feel for what to expect, and kept references to an altar. And he said that the cops that had responded earlier told him to expect some real weird shit, but not to call them because none of it was actually illegal, because they already went over it all. So we get there and do a quick walk around the property, and the home itself is fine. But there is a smaller building at the back that is completely burnt out. So we knock on the door and go in and start talking to the owner, and before he tells us what happened, he asked if we could be sure to have an open mind and not judge him until we hear the whole story, so we both agree. He proceeds to tell us that he is a priest of some religion that many would refer to as part of the occult. It wasn't voodoo, and it wasn't Santeria. I don't remember the name, but I do distinctly remember him saying that you had to have a Catholic Baptist at birth to be a part of it. And when we asked him what started the fire, he told us that his enemies put a curse on him, and it was spirits that caused the fire. And we both try to keep a straight face and think, oh, that sounds super legit. And then we ask him if we can go check it out, and he says, sure, fine. Just be careful, because a lot of the things that weren't completely destroyed are irreplaceable. So we go into the backyard to go start checking out the structure and start using his nine to search for accelerants, any flammable substances that could be used for arson. 
and his dog starts whimpering and will not go inside this building, which neither of us have ever seen. We managed to get the dog to go around the building and doesn't get any hits, so we put her away and go back and start looking ourselves. Well, the first thing I start finding are railroad spikes everywhere, which is a little strange, but nothing too crazy. Then I find an old shotgun, and I'm talking like real old. I don't know much about guns, but it looked like pre-World War I, and start thinking that's a little strange. Then we start finding the goat and chicken remains, which I know is used for voodoo and shit like that, and start getting real weirded out, and the guy I'm helping has even started to get the heebie-jeebies, and that is when shit hits the fan when we find a human skull. We immediately call the police detective back, and he says they know about it, but it wasn't illegal. I have no idea why, but we don't ask questions. According to homeowner, it belonged to one of his ancestors, and it was part of the ceremonies he does. Well, long story short, he couldn't find a reason for the fire to have started. Every idea I threw at him, he debunked with the evidence. I forget why candles were ruled out, but they were. There was no electricity running to the back building, and it was one of the lowest things in the area, so it couldn't have been lightning. As we were leaving, this dude tells us that he feels terrible, that we were forced to enter an area with such terrible dark magic, so he gave us the ingredients and instructions needed to cast some sort of cleansing ritual that involved reading some prayer that he wrote down for us, and mixing something called aqua florida with white flower petals and then dumping it over our heads which we promptly did as soon as we got back home hands down one of the creepiest things i've ever experienced i've worked as a park ranger for a little under 10 years most of which i spent working at yosemite national park Honestly, this job is pretty mundane most of the time, the most exciting things being random deer mutilations and teenage party sites. One day, however, I was doing my usual rounds and making sure everyone was out of the public facilities for the night. I was locking up the doors to the bathrooms when I heard what I thought was a little girl whispering. It was ever so faint, and if it wasn't such a still day, I wouldn't have heard it. I sat there for a moment and didn't hear anything further, so I started walking to where my truck was parked to make my way to my next stop. When I heard it again, a faint whisper of a little girl, I stopped and looked around and listened very closely. Yet again, I couldn't hear anything, nor could I see anything. Starting to feel a little creeped out, I quickly made my way to the truck and hopped in. I started the truck up and began to quickly take off when I saw it. A ghostly figure what I can only describe as an emaciated female. She had long pale limbs with a rubbery looking skin. Her eyes were pitch black and her mouth gaped wide open like her jaw was broken. I freaked the hell out and floored it out of there like a bat out of hell. I didn't lock the gate for that area and got some serious the next day for it but there was no way in hell I was going to face whatever ghost, demon, monster thing that was. I've never seen or heard anything like that since, and I really hope I never do again. This story has been told to me by my grandma, and it's common knowledge in the family, so I have no reason to disbelieve the story. So my granddad discovered in the army he had a gift for hypnosis. Turns out I'm not bad at it either, but far from being a performer, so I guess it runs in the family. So much that by word of mouth he started to become semi-famous, and he was impressive enough to have a producer wanting to sign him for a tour. My granddad declined one, because he had a good enough career as it was too. Because he was really tired after performing, so he didn't want to do this too often. After a while hypnotizing people, he tried on his sister. She started to have visions and even managed to help her husband to solve a few cases. He was a LIE inspector while under the spell of her brother. Now here comes the craziest shit ever, and if it was not coming from my family, I would have thought it's pure BS. Once in a while they had sessions with my granddad and her sister, just for discovery purposes, and to show off a bit, I guess. A doctor comes with his wife. When my grand aunt is under hypnosis, she tells, 
This woman has a spot behind her eye, and her blood flows backwards. All start to laugh, especially the doctor, who was already thinking everything was best. And for a while, nobody cares. Until a woman gets a tumor in her eye, and when she was examined in the hospital, she turned out to have her heart on the right side, and pretty much every organ on the opposite from usual side. There are other crazy stories with my granddad and his sis, but not one crazier than this one. It was a dark and stormy night in Ozark National Park. Ranger Tom had been patrolling the park for hours, making sure that all of the campsites were secure and that there were no wild animals lurking around. As he walked along the trails, he couldn't shake the feeling that he was being watched. He turned around several times, but there was never anyone there. It was as if someone was playing a trick on him, or worse, as if something malevolent was following him. Suddenly, Tom saw a shadow out of the corner of his eye. He spun around, trying to get a better look at what it was, but it was gone in an instant. He called out, hoping that it was just a fellow ranger or a hiker who was lost, but there was no response. Tom's heart began to race as he realized that whatever it was, it was not human. He could feel the presence of something evil, something otherworldly. He knew he had to get out of there as fast as he could. He began to run, his feet pounding the ground as he tried to escape the unknown terror that was chasing him. He could feel it getting closer and closer, and its presence almost suffocating him. Just when he thought he was going to be caught, Tom stumbled and fell to the ground. He looked up, expecting to see the shadow figure standing over him, but it was gone. Breathless and shaken, Tom made his way back to the ranger station. He told his co-workers what had happened, but they didn't believe him. They laughed and told him he was imagining things, that the storm and the dark night had just played tricks on his mind. But Tom knew what he had seen. He knew that there was something sinister lurking in the park, and he vowed to find out what it was. He spent the rest of his career searching for the shadow figure, never giving up hope that one day he would uncover the truth. There was a time when I thought that my life would be boring and mundane. Every day I'd get up, go to work, and then come home and take a nice shower before going to bed. Then one day, that all changed. Right after my youngest daughter started high school, my wife got a job in another state and we moved without much warning. And my daughter also changed school, so she wasn't around very often either. I remember how alone I felt until this day came when something called me from the darkness outside of town. It was about one eye. When, at first, I thought it was nothing more than a raccoon rummaging through the trash cans outside the house. Suddenly, from behind me, I appeared this very chiseled humanoid creature, standing well over seven feet tall with matted black hair. I don't know what it was looking for, but I can tell you that I almost had a heart attack when it turned around to face me with these glowing eyes. After what felt like an eternity of standing there in complete shock at the sight of this thing, it looked to me for about five seconds before disappearing. I would consider this creature a chupa bra, and based on what I've seen online and how this creature looked, after this, I started drinking every night and didn't stop until years later when I finally moved back to my hometown. To this day, I still think about this creature often, wondering if he's still out there somewhere lurking in the darkness, just waiting for another unsuspecting victim to pounce upon. I believe that would have been me had I been maybe in my full uniform. I was off duty at the time, so who knows? It's signings like this that make me wonder if all my years as an officer and service have really gotten to me. Maybe change the way my brain feels and works. Maybe I've gathered hallucinogenic peas from everything I've gone through because since then I've never seen anything quite like what I saw. But I can't help but feel that this was more than real and I didn't just have a vision. This was real. This was something that actually happened to me. I feel like if I had my radio or weapon on me, I would have taken a shot at this thing. Could it have been a demon? I don't know. I'm really not sure exactly what this was. But he opened his door and got out too, and we both stood staring at this creature for several minutes. 
When he began to move towards away from us at incredible speed, I turned back towards the cruiser, only to realize that my partner was no longer there. I was about to radio for backup when I heard a scream coming from the wood line. Just then, more silence. I didn't know what to do, so I just stood there where I was until backup had arrived. Once it did, we immediately set out into the woods to try and find my partner, who had been missing for nearly an hour at this point. It was dark and quiet, an uncomfortable silence that now settled over us as we searched desperately. Then I saw it, the most notable legend, the goat man darting through the trees several yards ahead of us. But after a few seconds it stopped, looking back at me like it knew I'd seen him. The only thing I could do was stand there in complete horror as this creature stared right back at me with its glowing eyes before it sought out to attack. Right before I felt his hands on me, my vision went black. I woke up to find myself strapped to a hospital bed with nobody else around. I've been here for the past few days now and haven't seen any of my fellow officers. I'm hoping to be released soon. The doctors are being very dodgy about it, saying they have more tests to run on me before they can sign me out. What could all of this mean, and where did my fellow officer go? Wildland Firefighter, once around 2 a.m., on a smaller lightning fire that was only like a half acre, the crew and I were taking a break from mopping up, chasing hot spots. Then all of a sudden, above the next ridge, over probably about one, two miles, as the crow flies, we see a large orange glowing light slowly moving from east to west. Someone spots it and thinks it's a plane at low altitudes, possibly running infrared to search for fires not found in the day. But another points out that the lights aren't flashing and something about planes being required to have two colors for identification. It could be a satellite, someone says. But it's orange and moving to slow. Also, it's too close to be in orbit. Then it just stops holds above the ridge for a few minutes and reverses direction west to east and pauses once more. It held for another few moments and then shot straight up onto space, not like it changed its direction and headed north. I mean, this thing jumped vertically straight up and disappeared. I've never been so excited and scared at the same time. Back in 2011, me and my buddy were standing post on the outskirts of our landing zone in a small patrol boat in Afghanistan. So we were a bit undermanned, so we only had roughly 20 guys on the patrol boat itself. Since this was the case, we stood pretty heinous post hours and ran a skeleton crew throughout the majority of the deployment. On this particular night, me and my buddy were standing post at probably about midnight or 1 a.m. He comes over the radio and tells me to check a direction and distance with my NBGs. Now I look over and radio back saying, negative, I have no visual of anything. He tells me to turn on my thermals and recheck. I swear to God there was a human-shaped figure out in the distance, but not moving. Just standing there, I switched back to my NBGs and again, nothing was there. It was starting to make my hair stand up. We called up to the COC to check on the G-Boss camera, but they couldn't see anything. The camera is a much bigger camera, essentially, with thermal capability. For the record, I do not believe in paranormal or supernatural activity. Our post lasted about six hours, and that figure was there on our thermals, not moving the entire time. It wasn't until we got relieved that it disappeared. We just chalked it up to sleep deprivation, but it always stuck with me. That was one of a couple times that weird shit happened out in the sandbox. I was a deputy sheriff for 13 years, and the majority of that time I worked in a large jail with a big population. I was a team leader of the tactical response team that roamed the hallways and responded to all the emergencies that would arise. Not just fights, but medical emergencies too. We had a set of cells in the admissions area that were isolation cells for the inmates who just got there and were problems. Either mentally or physically, cell three. I responded one night to a guy who took his pants off and tried hanging himself in the cell. 
He had a really good attempt and had to be rushed to the hospital. When we reviewed the camera footage to assist with our report, all you'd notice was him standing quietly in the cell for minutes looking at the camera. The camera glitches out, and when it comes back on, he is hanging himself. The next three days in the same cell, we had similar incidents. One guy was successful in bashing his head into the wall so hard it killed him. But every time we would watch the tapes, the guy would be standing there watching the camera mines before the attempt, and then the camera glitches. To this day, cell three still freaks me out, makes me think there was an entity in that cell causing people to kill themselves. Paramedic here. In the middle of the night, we got a call for cardiac arrest, so we respond and walk in with all our stuff. Ready to do work, a little old lady answers the door. She is really upset and begging us to help, saying that there's a dead woman on her couch. We walk in and no one is there. She is so adamant that there's a dead woman in her apartment and that we need to help her. To give her peace of mind, we walk through the apartment with her, even checking closets and whatnot. But as we were opening closets, I half expected a body to fall out or to find something. We didn't find anything, but the lady was still really distressed. I spent the rest of the night expecting to go back there because something just felt really off, even though we didn't find anything. Cop here. I had another officer at work meet up with me right after a call he was on. He said an elderly lady was insisting someone was getting into her mobile home and stealing things and moving them around when she was asleep or not home. This is the standard M.O. for dementia calls. They will insist, but the facts don't add up, and after talking to them for a while, you start to realize they aren't all there. Well, she had called us before and was advised by the officer to take some measures to prevent it or disprove it, which she obliged. She screwed all her windows shut, changed the locks on the doors, and installed cameras inside. She even set an alarm with motion detectors in the house and slept in her locked bedroom where she could arm and disarm from there without leaving the bedroom. And she said they were still getting inside the home. So the first thing I think at this part of the story is that it has to be dementia because how the hell would they get in now? That, or it's like those horror stories where a person is living in your attic. She has no attic, though, so that's out. Well, he reviews the video, and you can see her leave and lock the front door. Then, sure as shit, someone's hand can be seen in the edge of one of the frames inside the home. He said after seeing that he tore the place apart, inside and out. But there was no way in or out, no signs of forced entry, and nothing missing from the home. He said he ended up not taking a report because he couldn't figure out how to write one without saying it was a ghost. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.